at Dale County Harbor District Court of Harbor Commissioners meeting here in South San Francisco on November 15, 2017. Then we start with a roll call. Commissioner Bernardo? Commissioner Brennan? Here. Commissioner Chancarelli? Present. Commissioner Lorenz? Here. President Matouche? Here. All right, we're at the time of the evening when we get comments from the public. Uh, first public comment we have is from Dela Soul. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Dela. I'm from Pacifica. I live in Pacifica. <clears throat> Today I would uh, like to publicly comment on what I recently heard on NBC Bay Area and read about in an article that Clay Lambert wrote in Half Moon Bay Review. I was disappointed to find out that Sabrina Brennan had been sent pornographic pictures by the Harbor Commissioner President, Tom Matouche. I feel the desire to publicly comment on this to show Sabrina Brennan my support, as well as to add to the movement of women's voices that won't stand for this behavior anymore. Whether it be physical, verbal, or done with pics that might have been sent as a joke, I would love to see men turn around on a dime and take responsibility for their part in this culture and become women's advocate. Too many times we see women speak out and men say that it's a witch hunt. The women that come out with their stories are bringing light to this issue and are not doing it for some other agenda. This is a distraction. The shame that comes along with voicing these matters takes courage to say. This matter should pro properly be investigated as public officials, you are held to a much higher standard than the rest of us. If there is any time that you are under the spotlight, it would be now. We are watching closely on how this will be handled. I would like to see that the Harbor, Harbor District hire an independent third-party law firm to handle Sabrina's complaint. Thank you. James Lee Hahn. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is James Hahn from Redwood City. Uh, my comment today is about uh, the same topic. Um, I just want to start off by saying that uh, I've known Sabrina, full disclosure, I've known Sabrina for six years. Um, even if I didn't know her, um, I think, as Dela stated before me, uh, women do not come out with these uh, allegations lightly. They do not go on TV and talk about how they've been sent porn uh, as a joke or for some other agenda. They do this because they want to be heard and because they need to be believed. Um, I'm here because I believe Sabrina. Uh, I also want to echo Dayla's call that you need an independent third party law firm to investigate this complaint. Um, as much as I respect your in-house counsel, I've been a regular at these board meetings for the last five years. I've seen interactions between counsel and Commissioner Brennan that do not give me confidence that he will be able to undertake any investigation on this matter uh, with any uh, degree of objectivity. You need to hire an independent law firm that, and this is gonna be important for Commissioner Matouche too, if you two can both agree on an independent law firm to work on this complaint, that is the best outcome for this district. Um, also, uh, Mr. Lambert, who edits the Happen Bay Review recently, uh, just, just today I think, uh, said that maybe uh, with these new allegations, the district should be dissolved. Uh, I don't think that should, uh, be the outcome of what uh, came to light this week. Uh, I don't think we've seen in the past uh, the behavior of one man ruining um, entire things that are outside their outside of their personal realm. And so that shouldn't be what happens here. Uh, what I personally would like to see is to see Mr. Matouche resign. Uh, I worked on your campaign uh, very hard last year. Um, and I, you've, I've known you since 2014. We've had private conversations. And um, I'm afraid to say that my expectations of you have gone lower and lower over as time has gone on. So I don't expect you'll resign, uh, unfortunately, but I'm calling on you to do so. Um, I think it's the best thing for the future of this district. Um, and just to tie it into uh, one of my concerns about the previous meeting, um, uh, staff allowed Mr. Matouche to teleconference in to the meeting uh, and uh, cast the deciding vote on one, two, three, four, five different motions at last month's meeting. 
And during that meeting, uh, Mr. Matouche uh, used language um, against Commissioner Brennan that was very uh, uh, aggressive. And I feel that if you're going to allow someone to have the anonymity of teleconferencing in to a meeting, that only encourages that behavior. So as staff, I hope you put a stop to that sort of practice. Thank you. Kathleen Slater Carter. Thank you, President Mishtush, President and members of the board. Um, I've read the review. Um, I agree with Dela and James Lee Hahn that the district needs to take this very seriously, that this needs to be handled in closed session with an independent council. I am, um, I find the report that the district should be dissolved somewhat interesting. Maybe we should be dissolving Congress, the state legislature, the federal, the Senate, um, Hollywood. Uh, I think there's a whole lot of things that should be dissolved. Um, I think a investigation of this within the bounds of the law is very, very important. I think um, what has become the lynch mob mentality in this country should not be a part of this district. Local district is about relationships with people working together, both on the side of the, um, uh, between the public and the board and among the board members. And there will be differences. If this is a very serious issue. And I would recommend that it be handled in such a manner by professionals who are well versed in all of the um, nuances of this kind of thing. Um, I support the Harbor Commission in this, and I look forward to um, everyone acting in a very professional manner here. Um, you all represent every single one of us, and um, I know you will do so. So thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry that it that the social media has allowed these kinds of things to turn into mob mentalities, but that's where we are in 2017, and. Um, now we need to figure out how to deal with it professionally. Thank you. And that brings us to item two, commissioner comments. Uh, I have a comment so far from Commissioner Tank Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, point out that there is Commissioner Chan can you can you hit the mic or the microphone? Bring it closer. Yeah, a little better. No. The little green light's on. Is that better? Okay. Is it recording? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, if the green light is on, then that's what we got. Okay. Um, so there's this part of the Hathaway Bay Review um, opinion that said that I walked out of the meeting, and actually, and I wanted to just clarify that my walking out was actually an ex I excused myself from that meeting. I wanted to clarify that for the record. I don't know if the Hathaway Bay Review folks watched the video, but um, I excused myself from the Oyster Point Joint Liaison Committee meeting because we were advised by our attorneys that if we had continued to do the things in violation of the Brown Act, so I excused myself so that I could make sure that I was in compliance with the Brown Act. So Debbie, I have this article here with the highlighted area, and I'd like to submit this for the record, and I hope that you will record my comments in two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chan Corrales. Thank you. I'm going to read a comment. The first part of the comment is, uh, is my personal feelings surrounding this issue, and the latter part of it will, will touch on how, how I respond to this as a commissioner and my position. So, as a man, as a member of this community, I am not surprised that a fellow commissioner has made a claim of sexual harassment. 
because we live in a society that continues to have significant inequalities between men and women, and where sexual harassment and assault of women are still common, and because our society silences women about those experiences. So my, my inclination is to believe women when they disclose that they have been harassed or assaulted. Harassment, assault, and gender-based violence hurts us all. Women have begun to speak out against this at great risk of themselves. This moment may be uncomfortable, but it is an important moment. Women speaking out against gender-based violence empowers us all, women and men alike. Our society will become stronger because women are increasingly speaking up. We should look inside ourselves and understand This part's hard for me. Okay. We should look in inside ourselves. Oh, I didn't think it would get ugly and emotional about this. But I guess I feel strongly. Okay. We should look inside ourselves to understand how we have enabled and contributed to this. Hmm. I'm surprised at myself. I didn't think I'd get emotional about this. This is so common. Well, we should strive to eliminate, eliminate, excuse me, we should look inside ourselves to understand how we, how we have enabled We should strive to eliminate them with our, with our uh, thoughts and actions that lead to equity for all members of our community. And I'm angry for the time of my life that I didn't speak up against gender inequality. Or speak loud enough and say it was wrong. Or that this is unacceptable. So, regarding the current claim of sexual harassment, <coughs> as, an, as an elected official, your commissioner, I am bound to work within the structure that we have in place. And I do have some concerns that the district's policy regarding sexual harassment is flawed and does not act adequately address the problem. However, I commit to work diligently within the structure of the district to ensure that this process is fair. And further, going forward, I'm going to work to ensure that this commission becomes and remains the place where both women and men participate and are included and respected and treated equitably. Any other comments? <clears throat> All right, moving on with our consent calendar. I've had a request by Commissioner Brennan to pull items 1, 6, 8, and 11. I've had a request from Commissioner Lorenas to pull items 2, 7, and 9. We have a motion to approve items 3, 4, 5, and 10. So moved. I'll second. Uh, roll call. <coughs> President Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorenis? Aye. Commissioner Trancarelli? Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Okay, moving on to discussion item 12, Oyster Point Marina financial analysis. <laughs> 
Nita, do we have a report? Yes. Thank you, President Matush and Commissioners. On, uh, on this report, at the request of the Finance Committee, the, oh, sorry. Is this working? It's working now? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, at the request of the Finance Committee, the San Mateo County Harbor District engaged Dornbush Associates to perform a financial analysis of Oyster Point Marina. The primary objective of this analysis was to analyze the financial implications of undertaking capital improvement investments and their relationship to existing joint powers agreement with South San Francisco and any potential new agreement. A draft report was prepared by Dawn Bush and was presented to the San Mateo County Harbor District's Oyster Point Marina Committee on October 31st, 2017. The following factors were among those considered in the report existing JPA termination in 2016, docks at Oyster Point Marina needing repair and replacement, should the district negotiate a new agreement with South San Francisco, and if so, what should be the term of the agreement to address necessary capital improvements? We have a representative here from Dornbush, Casey Caldwell, and he has a, a presentation for you. And what they're requesting uh, at this point is input and direction from the Board of Commissioners on their draft report before it is finalized. If there are no um, uh, edits or recommendations to change the report, then this report will be considered the final report. So Casey, did you wanna? Uh, sure, would you like me to speak at the podium or over here? Uh, the po um, would, podium would probably be better so that everybody can hear you. Okay. Me to uh, yeah. manage this. Um, yeah, this is primarily going to be for the tables. So I'll just expand this a little bit. Yeah, the packet that you had that was distributed uh, today so. um, was what Casey provided as the latest that he was presenting on today. Okay. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We should be, yes. I will confirm with him as soon as Casey, that uh, last email that you sent me with the pack of uh, tables. Uh -huh. Have you distributed that today? Is that the same as what's we're presenting today? Uh, that's right. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the 12-page um, summary document. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see if this wireless mouse works from this far. It looks like it does. Okay. All right. Um, so as Anita mentioned, uh, my name is Casey Cornwell. I'm with uh, Dornbush Associates, a uh, small consultancy based in Berkeley, California, uh, focusing on uh, economic and financial analysis, primarily of recreational services for um, various public agencies. And as she mentioned, we were engaged to look at a couple of uh, financial scenarios related to uh, Oyster Point Marina, uh, with under the consideration, of course, that the, the JPA uh, is expiring uh, in 2026. And uh, the key thrust behind this analysis was to determine whether um, it makes financial sense uh, to continue kind of with the status quo and the existing docks or to um, undertake the capital improvement project, uh, which will, we will have a chart showing what the various investments are, but uh, that totals about $10 million for Oyster Point Marina through 2022, uh, plus additional investments after that. Um, so as part of this analysis, we looked at two specific scenarios. The first was primarily a uh, status quo uh, and, in which um, the Harbor District would not replace the docks prior to the expiration of the JPA, uh, but they continue to operate OPM and uh, maintain the docks, um, and they would not seek to extend the JPA beyond 2026. Um, the scenario also assumes that the marina would, would revert back to South San Francisco at the expiration of the JPA in 2026. Uh, then we also looked at scenario two, as we called it, uh, in which the Harbor District would undertake the capital improvement program, investing that money, um, uh, investing the $10 million over the next approximately five or six years, 
uh, and then seek to negotiate a new JPA um, for a period that would be su sufficient for the Harbor District to amortize its investments um, and generate the appropriate level of reserves to undertake future dock replacements. Um, so really the, the results come down to comparing those two scenarios, but if, um, you know, one caveat that we put in the report before we even get into the financials um, is that any investment uh, that's undertaken, uh, before, before any significant investment is undertaken, uh, there should be um, an amendment to the existing JP. And I know there's been a parallel process going on looking into this specific question about uh, the value of investments that are made and whether, depreci whether the depreciated value reverts back to the Harbor District in the event that the JP is terminated or, what, um, or whether uh, the value of the docks uh, reverts to South San Francisco. And we, we made the argument that it should be clarified that any investment um, should be amortized, should be um, depreciated with a transparent uh, straight line formula, perhaps, and that um, if the JPA were to end, that the Harbor District should be able to obtain the depreciated value of its investments going forward. That language wasn't clear in the existing JPA. So that's just a caveat when we're talking about any kind of investment. Could you explain that in more layman's terms so the public can understand what you're yeah. saying? Okay, so currently in the Joint Powers Agreement, there's some relatively unclear language about um, whether the Harbor District is entitled to the residual value of any investments that it makes over time. So when you, when you invest in a dock, say for a million dollars, and it's depreciating at $100,000 a year, if the JPA were to end in two years and the dock's worth $800,000, would the Harbor District be compensated by South San Francisco the $800,000 for the investment in that dock? Uh, that's what we're talking about. And we're saying that there should be language um, in the existing JPA, it should be amended so that it's clear that um, such a transparent depreciation policy is, is included so that the Harbor District is compensated for any investment that it makes at a fair rate um, going forward. And, and just to clarify, so council doesn't think that that's clear in the existing JPA? It's a question for Mr. Miller. I've had no part in working with Dornbush on this report whatsoever. I'm seeing it for the first time as you are seeing it. Okay. Yeah, um, the way that we read the JPA in undertaking this report was that it, there was that it was unclear, and it was my understanding that there was some review of some of this language going on. Um, that was discussed at finance committee <laughs> meetings with our general manager. That council was to be working alongside Dornbush with this report. Uh, uh, my understanding was that it was a parallel process that they were investigating that language. <coughs> Yeah. That's right. And the Finance Committee requested uh, uh, Council to opine on that with finalizing numbers and that will distribute a document, but it will be a, uh, a document directly from the District Council to the Board. I'm confused because Council just said they weren't aware of this. Council was not involved in the uh, development of the Dornbush Report. So can you clarify, is council now working on something separate? Council is, uh, I think there were paragraphs 12 and 20 of the JPA uh, related, I think those are the numbers off the top of my head, that were related to uh, uh, termination of the JPA or the end of the JPA and the council is examining that language. And that's the scope of their task. It, that I, I'm asking Mr. Miller, is that what you're working on? So I, I have uh, prepared a memo about four months ago waiting for finalization of some budget numbers that uh, provides my uh, opinion as to uh, the interpretation of some of the provisions that uh, the Dornbush Group seems to be talking about as being ambiguous. Um, that's not an opinion that without your express determination, I'm prepared to discuss in a public session. Why has the board not been provided that if it was provided four months ago? I believe the answer is because the numbers on which a lot of the analysis rests 
we're pending finalizing of the 15-16 budget, if I've got my right fiscal year. 16 is the audit, excuse me, the audit. And so, um, uh, understandably, we wanted to make sure that we had the numbers accurate in the report. And when was the audit complete? I believe uh, the last board meeting is when we presented the audit. So it was about a month ago. So we will get that information then? As soon as we can, pro uh, yeah, as soon as uh, we can get with council and they have the numbers and they want to update their memo, we can, as soon as it's ready. And, and how will the memo be provided to us? <coughs> so I've given that a little bit of thought. I have to consult with the general manager and figure out what the best way to make that happen is. We're not trying to hide anything from you. We're just trying to find the right, the best way to communicate that to you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Yeah, so that particular issue actually doesn't impact the numbers that we're presenting here. It's just a consideration that should be, um, that everyone should agree upon before any investment uh, would be undertaken there. Um, so when we're comparing these two scenarios, what basic, essentially whether you are just continuing status quo or you're undertaking the CIP and replacing the docs, um, there's going to be uh, differences in our revenue projections. Um, we make assumptions about how occupancy rates change uh, based on voters' preferences for newer docs. Uh, we have some evidence about that, which I'll get into a little bit uh, later. Um, so higher occupancy rates would be one contributor to higher revenue. Uh, what would also contribute to higher revenue would be um, high, pot potentially higher willingness to pay or higher rental rates. If the marina had uh, upgraded amenities based on the replacement of docks, um, there would potentially be the ability to raise rates um, while not impacting uh, these occupancy rate projection, projections that we're talking about. Um, so I want to kind of touch upon our conclusion before I get into all of these assumptions. You can stop me at any time if we get into too much detail here. Um, I'm going to try to run through these tables fairly quickly. Um, but what we found was that um, if the CIP were undertaken, uh, the additional revenue that would be generated and the additional net income that would be generated would be at the margin uh, almost sufficient to be able to um, develop, a, basically exceed this, the status quo baseline case to such an extent that you'd be able to basically develop a reserve to reinvest in the docks when they reach the end of their useful life in 30 years. In other words, it would be uh, potentially possible to create a self-sustaining investment without having a uh, significant impact uh, relative to a baseline case on your annual net income. So that's kind of the, and that's really on the margin. We're, we're kind of uh, neutral in the, rec in the recommendation. We have one scenario, two, where we had a more aggressive um, assumption about uh, occupancy rates and rental rates. And, the, and that rental rate assumption was based upon a market analysis that was performed last year by a firm called Anchor QEA for South San Francisco. We looked into those rates a little more closely and thought they might be unrealistic. So we actually created a scenario two and a half where the increase in rental rates was only half of what uh, we're assuming in scenario two. So the results that we, should, that we came up with in the report that are presented in detail in the report show that in scenario two with the marginally higher rates, you have this self-sustaining fund plus a little bit of, I can do that. <laughs> okay, there it is plus a little bit of um, excess net income in each year. Whereas in scenario two and a half, you come up short by only about $30,000, which is really rounding error, error when you're talking about a marina that's generating about uh, 1.5 to $2 million a year. So, um, you know, um, from a financial perspective, we believe that um, it would be possible to make these investments um, and we basically don't have a strong opinion either way about it, but we believe that the, it would be possible and the Harbor District would be able to generate sufficient revenue to um, make these investments uh, without significantly impacting the other, the, uh, the Oyster Point Marina's net income or the Harbor District's net income over time. <coughs> the specific numbers will show in some of the tables going forward, but like I said, it's really a, about a $30,000 difference. Was this based on a thorough understanding of the development phasing schedule? 
Um, we know that's been up in the air. I know there's been a, a more recent update to that schedule. Um, and we put in caveats about uncertainties. We try not to be too aggressive in any of our projections. When we talk about um, replacing these docks as well, um, we also put in construction period times for the marina itself so that there are impacts to the occupancy rates when docks are being replaced. So in that sense, there's not an overly aggressive assumption about how many slips are occupied at any given time. Did well. you also um, factor in the other improvements that would need to happen over time that cost to maintain the infrastructure there? Uh, we mentioned in one section of the report um, several, um, and without putting a number on certain items, uh, several different items um, that may require a Harbor District investment, but our understanding at this time, given some inputs um, and questions that we posed um, to the administration, um, given their understanding of who's responsible for which investment. So like, for example, the grade or the, the um, it's not called the seawall, but kind of the grading of the peninsula itself. You know, but there may need, may need to be some work there, but uh, the understanding is that Oyster Point development is doing the majority of that work and that it would not be um, investment there. But you can, you can look into the report for details about items like that. I mean, we talked about dredging. There is an assumption in the CIP about dredging uh, within the next couple of years. Um, we got some feedback um, from the Harbor Master that more extensive dredging may, may potentially be necessary in the near term. So there are some minor issues like that. We put the caveat into the report that given our understanding of the investments that would take place and the CIP investments, um, uh, we built our uh, depreciation schedule off of that, uh, and we compared that depreciation schedule to the potential um, increases in revenue and net income that would be generated by, uh, by the CIP investments themselves. So understanding that there are uncertainties, we, we, we tried to quantify, not well, we tried to at least qualitatively describe several of those potential investments in the report as well, if we weren't sure about the numbers. Yeah. And you factored in cost for relocating the Harbor Master's office? Uh, that was one of the costs. Um, the cost of the Harbor Master's office is one of the costs listed in the CIP. Um, if you're talking about... Um, I'm just, you're you're yeah. saying that we're going to almost break even, but be slightly in the red, right? That's what you're saying? Uh, in the more conservative scenario, but then in the slightly more optimistic scenario, you actually are generating a, a $90,000 surplus after, after making the okay, So, so you're, it's, it's very right at um, the margin, like at equilibrium almost. Mm -hmm. What page do we find the list of CIP <coughs> projects that are included in those, in those scenarios? Um, within this summary document, um, I can, it's on page five. Uh, it's right underneath the heading scenario to undertake the CIP investments. Page five? Page five of the summary document. Page 22 of the report. Uh, it's page 22 of the report itself. So I have it up on the screen as well, uh, the top of that table. I know it's hard to read it. Scenario um, two, right? Exhibit uh, Yeah, so this is, uh, this summary document is just pull, is tables pulled from the main report. So we discuss the list of CIP investments under scenario two, which is the, which is the scenario in which you undertake those investments. I'm sorry, which one is two? Scenario two is the one in which you would undertake the CIP investments. Scenario one is just the status quo where you do not make any investments and just maintain the marina as it is right now. Okay. Yeah. And so if we did the things listed here mm -hmm. on this time frame, mm -hmm. you're saying that we would still, that we would not be in the red? Uh, it's not, no, it's actually in the red from an income statement perspective. So when you're making these investments, these don't count against revenues in that year specifically because we, we, we amortize them, we put a depreciation schedule on them. Um, oh, so we're assuming that we get money back, or I'm, I'm um, confused. No. About how that works. So the way that it would show up on a financial statement is that um, it would be a capital investment, and then on your actual profit and loss statement for the year or your income statement, you would only, for example, for a dock, you would only um, 
put as an expense, a depreciation <coughs> expense, one thirtieth of the investment amount, assuming that docks last for 30 years and you're, and you're depreciating it on a straight line basis. So the framework for the analysis is that the additional revenue generated because voters want the new docks and are willing to pay more for new docks and might benefit from some of the other upgrades that are happening at Oyster Point, that additional revenue as compared to the baseline is actually very similar to that total depreciation expense that's generated by this CIP project. So from an income statement perspective from year to year, your net income looks very similar when you replace the docks or if you don't. And what that's telling you is that um, you're actually generating enough uh, additional revenue to offset the depreciation of the docks. And what that allows you to do is um, to basically reinvest in the docks over time. So in 30 years, you'll have enough additional funding set aside to, to invest in the docks. Because depreciation is a not, because <laughs> it's, it's hard to explain financial statements uh, in person, but de since depreciation is a non-cash expense, it, you basically made the investment in year one, but you're, um, you're amortizing it over time on your financial statements. I guess, I guess what I don't understand is how is it an investment when we don't actually own any of it? Well, uh, one of the things, one of the items that we were tasked to do was also to talk about the extension of the JPA. So that although you don't physically own the property um, at Oyster Point, um, if you were to extend the uh, JPA for a period of 30 years, which is the average useful life, or basically the prescribed useful life for some of these new concrete floating docks, um, that you'd be able to get um, all of your investment out of them. And it, it's, it's similar to having ownership in the asset because you're not, you're basically benefiting from the use of it and you're not um, concerned about you know, losing the investment that you made in it if you extend the JPA for, for an adequate period of time. Um. Okay, I, I have a related question to this. On, uh, I don't know if you have, have this numbered the same as I do in my sheet. Okay. But on page 25, mm -hmm. you make a statement in the middle of the page that says, Thornbush judges that with new docks and upgraded land site amenities associated with the plan, CIP improvements, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's where you make the statement about occupancy rates. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable with my understanding of, of how you came to that conclusion. And it'd be great if you could make me a little more comfortable with it. So for example, mm -hmm. the, if the development that is scheduled to happen at Oyster Point does happen, mm -hmm. It's very likely that the area will experience a much greater traffic problems, for example. How is that going to weigh into your judgment of that people will want to pay more for a, a space at this right. marina? Mm -hmm. So can you help me out? Yeah. Um, Oyster Point, obviously, the development is going to bring uh, more negatives than positives, maybe in the short term because of construction and the impacts related to that. Um, in the long term, we know there are going to be impacts. Um, we think there's going to be some positive ones, just with uh, greater awareness of the marina, given the fact that you know some compute, some additional commuters are going to be coming back and forth from ferries uh, through Oyster Point. There's going to be a lot more you know office development around. There's, there's there's the potential for a hotel to be built that could potentially have a restaurant, which would be an additional amenity. We don't quantify a lot of this because we know a lot of it is uncertain right now. Um, so we basically, like I said, we tried to be conservative in developing these um, occupancy rates. Um, currently, the overall occupancy at, uh, rate at the marina is 77%. Uh, there's 313 out of the 408 slips um, that are occupied, and that was the first table in the <coughs> summary document. And the table kind of show, the table shows that, you know, for example, doc 11. You know, which has been recently replaced, which is the new high-quality high dock, has that 95% occupancy, the highest in the marina. You know, a lot of people interested in it. It also has a higher share of the 40 and 45-foot uh, slips, which are in uh, kind of relatively higher demand. Um, and what's interesting about the Oyster Point development itself is that we kind of assume 
we assume that it impacts both scenario one, which is the status quo, and scenario two equally, because it's gonna happen regardless of what, what we do, what the Har Harbor District does. So that really, we tried to keep the occupancy impacts related to um, evidence that we have from this slip replacement that's occurred already itself, um, and then the rates associated with that. Um, so I understand, you know, that, you know, what happens, you know, if there is traffic, that is gonna impact people. Or that on the flip side, you know, if there's a nice, uh, you know, waterfront park and promenade that's part of the OPD development, that might make, make the arena, um, marina itself seem more attractive, and that'll, that'll contribute to the occupancy rate. The occupancy rates that we have in each scenario, scenario one is status quo, so we assume it stays at 77% overall, like it is now. And then in scenario two, uh, that's increased to the regional, oh, the average of some of the regional competitors, so that's about 83%, I believe, uh, in that scenario. So we're not, we're not assuming that occupancy is gonna exceed a lot of, of the, these regional competitors, we're not making any claims like that, but we, we're just saying that with the infrastructure upgrades, um, with the investment, that you could at least match what, it, what is kind of in Did the area. Did you factor so, in the, um, the number of years of construction? Because clearly we're going to lose occupancy during the construction phase of the project. I, you know, it's going to be very disruptive. Do we know what, I mean, I see that the city manager's here, maybe he could share with us what the construction phasing might look like, but we've asked for that before, and maybe our, maybe our staff has it, but I've yet to see a construction phase schedule, and it would be helpful, I think, because if the, you know, if the construction goes on for five years, that's something that we would want to factor into this, and I think we do need to quantify the information. Um, just shooting from the hip doesn't give us a very good picture. Uh, even if we, I agree, we want to quantify as much as we can. Um, even with the schedule, we don't necessarily know how voters are gonna react. We know that um, the overall occupancy, Sierra Point, um, some of the other marinas in the immediate area are also in the 80% range. There's not a lot of alternatives to go if that's if this is your preferred place. So there may be, yeah, there may be impacts associated with uh, that construction. There's there's limits to the downside as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, my understanding has always been that a big part of the occupancy problem at OPM is more related to the challenges around the wind there. Mm -hmm and because it's so windy, and then also um, the turbulence caused by the ferry going in and out mm -hmm. um, is challenging for voters, especially for the 10% that live aboard. Um, mm -hmm. So those are things that I think need to get factored into the equation, and I think when you look at how our occupancy is low, com comparatively speaking, it's always been my understanding from talking to voters that those were, you know, two of the yeah. main factors. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, definitely marginally lower. I can pull up that table as well. It's Exhibit 19 in the report. Just kind of some of the regional occupancy rates. Where, what page is that on? Um, in the summary document, it's page six. I think it's around page 25 in the in the May report. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's 25. Yeah. yeah. So you can see Oyster Cove, Brisbane, Co uh, Coyote Point. Um, you know, <coughs> they're in the 78, 80, 84 range, um, slightly higher than the overall 77 percent that you have right now. But we're trying to use some of the evidence that we do have from the investment that's been done. So, like I said, that Dock 11 has a waiting list, and it has it's essentially fully occupied. Um, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Am I reading this correct? We are the lowest one on this list as far as occupancy goes? Um, I mean, there's, I see one down there that's 50, one that's 62. Um, I guess I'm looking at a different page. Oh, sorry, exhibit 19? Oh, page 25. Page 25. Yeah. I only see oyster. Oh, 
Oh, maybe I'm not looking at the amended. Yeah, it's the same as though that he's, he's going on in the presentation, which is the amended version. Uh, okay. Um, <coughs> okay. So the thing about the new dock, like I agree, the new floating dock has it's attractive to people and the, float, the new floating docks are really nice there's no question mm -hmm. i mean we would it would be so awesome if we had those at pillar point harbor our docks are in absolutely terrible condition at pillar point harbor where we have completely full occupancy um, however if you have new docks throughout the whole facility it may even out because right now that one's special and so people want to go to that one because it's the nicest but if they're all nice it doesn't guarantee that it's going to increase occupancy so i think we have to quantify things further i'm just concerned that we would as a district put money into something like this when we know we have an extremely popular facility at pillar point harbor where we have always had great occupancy and our docks are in total disrepair so i'm just having a hard time making any sense out of why this would be a good a good use of public funds um, and how how this would benefit the public the most i mean we, there's only so much money to go around and our facility that we own is in extreme disrepair um, and we need you know to upgrade pretty much everything so it's just it's hard to you know stomach the idea that we would sink all this money into brand new docks at a facility that we don't actually own when the facility that we do own um, is in dire need and i thought when the finance committee requested this report we were going to be looking at those types of comparisons that's what we talked about in our finance committee meeting and that's the type of report we requested um, looking at what the best use of the district's funds are and you know where we could get the most bang for our buck and where we ought to really be making our investments and so that's not the report that we got so I'm disappointed because this is not what the Finance Committee requested um, it's still valuable information and I think maybe like analysis 2.0 could help us look at that and draw some comparisons and really think about where we ought to be prioritizing our funding. Um, but we aren't doing that with this report. So I'm, I've talked to John Warren about this before. I think I, it was my understanding that staff directed you to go in this direction with it. It mm -hmm. wasn't the committee that did. And um, I think that might have been, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't what the committee had hoped for. Um, so I hope that we can figure out a way to kind of salvage this and make it more useful for the district so we can figure out, you know, what the best use of our dollars is. And I think I've been really clear in the past that I think the district should be investing in the facility that we own. And so I just don't see that represented here. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you that yeah, the scope that you're talking about would be valuable too. Uh, with the scope that we were given, as I mentioned, uh, we're trying to be conservative with the assumptions, not going overboard. Like I said, the increase in occupancy was only up to 82.5, 83% overall uh, in scenario two. Uh, you talk about, and I agree that demand will even out if all, all of the docks are replaced and you have the floating concrete docks. There's that impact as well, but I mean, we took that kind of idea into consideration. One of the mitigating factors for that uh, would be that um, when docks are replaced, you could also slightly re reconfigure into um, slip size ranges that are more in demand at, you know, relatively in demand where trends are going. For example, the 40, 45 foot slips overall have a higher occupancy rate than some of the smaller ones. So you could have some minor shifts in there uh, the model that we put together can actually accommodate some of those assumptions and, and uh, the delays in construction too. So I mean, yeah, I hope that we have provided some some useful information here. Uh, but I agree that compared to the analysis, it would also be interesting. Yeah, because if we added more slips at Pillar Point Harbor, it's pretty well known that we would fill them. So that would be more revenue coming in for the district and more money we could put towards making needed repairs. 
Um, so like we know we have a good thing going at Pillar Point Harbor and we've got a long waiting list of people that want slips. We just don't have that at Oyster Point. So I mean those are realities that I think this report misses and those are really important things we need to consider. Yeah, I think we're dealing with real real numbers as much as we can, but there's always going to be assumptions. I'm not going to present a report saying we know that something is going to pan out this way. That's never true in forecasting, but uh, like I said, we always try to be conser as conservative uh, as we can. <coughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's okay. So I, I mean, I don't know how much we want to get into these uh, assumptions right now. I mean, I think I've talked about some of the key conclusions. Um, if you want to look at numbers associated with that, we can kind of scroll down to those. Um, or, or is there any other information that specifically you're interested in right now? I, I want to understand the whole thing. I mean, I think this is really important. And we, you know, it was a big deal to um, get you guys on board to help us with this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would like to hear about your conclusions and yeah. how you quantitated the information. No, I, for one, am interested in your assumptions because all your numbers are based on those and mm -hmm. without, without really getting an understanding of okay. where those play into the numbers. The numbers really don't do a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, so we'll scroll <coughs> quickly through uh, these tables. Uh, going back to, I'll start on, uh, very quickly, uh, just starting on page one, this was the table that was initially up there. Um, it just shows the different dock numbers across the top row uh, and the different uh, slip size ranges along the left column. And this is the number of occupied slips that are in each size range and specifically in each dock. Um, so like I said, the total number of occupied slips at the marina is 313 right now. That's 77% occupancy. Um, you'll note that if you look down column 11, you have uh, the 96% occupancy rate at the bottom of the table uh, compared to the occupancy rates in, in the other docks, which are uh, uh, typically in the 60 to 80% range. I'm sorry, what um, page are we on? This is on, uh, this is exhibit four. <coughs> It's page one of the summary document. Page six of the report. Uh, page six of the report, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is one, one piece of evidence that we use kind of showing that, you know, just to demonstrate that there is demand there uh, for the new doc, uh, expecting that similar uh, bumps would occur as other docs are replaced as well. Um, Excuse me, yep. Mr. Weston. On dock 11, mm -hmm. so this, this, um, this was a replacement mm -hmm. to a concrete dock. Do you, do you have somewhere what the occupancy was before the replacement? Uh, we don't have that number uh, in the report, but I believe that we um, examined <laughs> that. Could you tell yeah. us what that was? Uh, I'd have to go back and look at that. I don't know. Could you email yeah. it or something? Yeah, OK. Yeah, I can do that. OK. Uh, uh, exhibit 5, which is our next table in this summary document, uh, just gives a a uh, brief de um, <coughs> description of, a uh, summary of uh, the operating revenue at Oyster Point Marina uh, over a five year period, uh, 2011 through 2015. Um, so this would be what the district is now referring to as enterprise revenue, whereas the tax revenue is, is referred to as public revenue. So this is all the enterprise revenue that's generated at Oyster Point Marina. It includes slip rental, which is the vast majority. It's about 72% of overall revenue at the marina, about a million dollars a year. Then the rents and concessions, uh, which, um, you know, were the rents for, some, for Drake Marine, uh, some of the parcels that are going away under the Oyster Point Development Agreement. And then we made adjustments for that, for that revenue in, in all of the scenarios going forward. Um, there's also transient dockage revenue, smaller smaller revenue streams like launching fees, dock box fees, and dock box fees. Um, this is just summary showing what revenue is. Um, 
this Exhibit 7 uh, summarizes that op operating revenue, but it also shows uh, what we referred to as total operating expenses. We were using um, the accounting uh, conventions that were in place prior to um, the last fiscal year in which uh, the public and enterprise expense streams were split apart. So when we look at operating expenses here, this includes um, all of the expenses associated with those revenue streams that we're talking about at the marina, but also some of the public expenses as well, which is kind of like uh, some of the expenses associated with maintaining uh, the park on the peninsula uh, and things like that. Um, so before, th so this negative net operating income that you see in this table occurs before the public revenue contribution that you attribute to Oyster Point Marina. Um, that's why that shows negative here. And that's historically how financials were presented by the Harbor District. Now you would basically have a new top line that would say public revenue. And you would have, um, you would have basically, essentially a, a positive operating. This is just a technical detail, but I just wanted that to be clear. Um, who are very familiar with some of those numbers. Um, this Exhibit 8 right here does a comparison of historic Oyster Point and Pillar Point net income. Even though our scope didn't talk about a comparative analysis, we thought it was kind of important just to bring this historical data in to show that um, from a net income perspective, before taking that public revenue into account um, historically, Oyster Point has had a slightly larger loss um, annually than Pillar Point, but it's been very similar. It's definitely been in the same range. Um, net income uh, averaged a $1.4 million loss for Oyster Point and a $1.1 million loss for Pillar Point. This was just for um, context. We weren't really making a statement about anything, but just kind of um, additional uh, context for making decisions about um, making investments at Oyster Point. Um, so then we get into our scenario-specific assumptions. Scenario one is that status quo ass um, assumptions where uh, we assume that we just maintain the docks in their current condition and don't make those uh, capital uh, improvement program investments. So uh, basically what we're saying in scenario one is that the projected occupancy rate is, is similar to what it is currently. It's at um, 77%. Um, there's, not, um, there's not movement on that going forward. And that's, in that, that's the scenario assumption. And then slip rates under the scenario uh, would just increase uh, by CPI is, is what we understand what the policy is right now, just increasing by CPI what, uh, from what they are currently. Um, so, I got stuck for a second. <coughs> so with those uh, occupancy rate and uh, rental rate assumptions, uh, so Exhibit 11 shows the projected slip revenues um, uh, from 2018 to 2027 in this scenario one, basically just kind of ramping up from where they are currently because they're based on current numbers. Um, nothing too controversial there. So scenario two, uh, if you look at um, exhibit 18, you could stop me at any time, <laughs> two or three. Um, Exhibit 18 just summarizes uh, what the CIP, what the Capital Improvement Program consists of. So uh, it, it consists, the, the bulk of the investment is in dock replacement. There's phasing, uh, there's proposed phasing associated with that. So it would go dock 12, dock 13, dock 14, so on. Um, and that's all listed in the table there. Uh, there's, like I, like I mentioned, there is some funding in there for dredging expense. Um, removal of the bait shop, you can see all these different line items uh, that are in there. So we're now um, in scenario two? Yes, yeah. Scenario one was really status quo. There's nothing terribly interesting about the assumptions. Like I said, it's just status quo occupancy rate and status quo um, rental rates in the next, you know, I have a yeah. question about yeah. scenario one before mm -hmm. the two. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be helpful to go over these other exhibits, like 14 and 16, 
17, so I understand them. And then also, if what seems most likely to me is scenario one, plus we're paying for CIP projects now. So we haven't not been doing CIP projects. We actually have, we, we just approved a CIP project at our last board meeting. Um, and there's another, I mean, there's <coughs> projects that come up frequently. So wouldn't it be more logical or just more realistic, I guess, to have scenario one with some CIP projects included? Uh, we, uh, it would be, understanding that they're being undertaken or they've been approved right now. I think we started this project almost six months ago, so things have been shifting a little bit since when we actually composed the initial draft of this report. Um, so if, yeah, so if there are adjustments associated with that, um, you know, in the final report, we can make those adjustments and, and put them in the final numbers. I think yeah. we have to take some yeah. of the CIP projects yeah. and move them over to the scenario form mm -hmm. to see what that, because that's, <coughs> it doesn't seem very realistic, scenario one with no CIP projects in it. Because things yeah. break and you have to fix them. You, mm -hmm. know? you have safety issues you have to address. And Right, yeah. I, um, a lot of, I mean, we do have, um, ma we do have maintenance expenses increasing over the, um, over what they have been historically in scenario one because we understand that the docks are aging, things do break. Um, a lot of those CIP projects aren't specifically maintenance related; they're big, they're big capital improvements. But there are, but there <coughs> probably are some that would fall into that. Um, so if we, you know, if we clarify what's been approved, we can we can move those over what, as well. What was that project we just approved? Mm -hmm. I think at a recent meeting that was like some electrical thing. Was that CIP or was that considered maintenance? Uh, I think that was a, a maintenance project. We listed it as a major capital expense, but it was a replacement of uh, some transformers. And what was the cost on that, roughly? The total project cost was 485, but that included Pillar Point, and I think it was 300 of that was at Oyster Point, roughly. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's stuff like that that we need to make sure we're including in our thinking because stuff comes up. Yeah. And I'd, I'd also echo uh, Casey that total operating expenses, um, including maintenance, by 2022, for example, at two and a half million dollars a year. And I do know that Casey talked about the impact of maintaining aging facilities versus maintaining new facilities. That aging facilities take more maintenance, new facilities take less. I don't know how clearly that would reflect in, in the report. Mm -hmm. I know that that conversation has taken place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, was there a specific exhibit that you wanted to look at? Um, um, well, just we didn't go over 14, 16, and 17, and I just wondered if you could explain what we're looking at here. Okay, I actually don't have the full report in front of me. I was just presenting this <laughs> this summary, oh, so I can take a let me take a look at someone's. Um, I just see a lot of red numbers, so that makes me curious. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Exhibit 14 is the projected net operating income for the marina uh, going forward. And again, if that's using the conventions that were used historically where you don't, you don't have the public revenue as a top line. Uh, you know, historically, you would show that each of the marinas was losing money each year, and then you have, um, then you have, the, pub, then you have the tax revenue money coming in and plugging that loss. Uh, so we kept that convention because that was, uh, it was easier just to talk about the future in the context of the historic data. Um, but like I said, the operating expenses in this table would include not only the enterprise operating expenses at the marina, but also some of the public expenses, which um, as we were putting this report together, the, dis the district was still in the process of separating out. So we didn't have the data, we didn't have the data to be able to separate that out, and that's why, you know, you wouldn't have these negative numbers if we were able to separate that out at the time. Um, so that's why they look like that here. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and I just want to emphasize 
both of the scenarios will show kind of this negative, um, what we call operating income. Um, but it's really the comparative between the two scenarios that's really important as we get into some of the later tables. It's really comparing how scenario two changes com compared to uh, scenario one is where it really kind of uh, the meat of the analysis comes in. Yeah. So you said uh, 16 as well, just kind of the same, same type of thing. Is there a chart that shows, because you said that Scenario one, we would be thirty thousand dollars a year in, yeah. in the red. Is that where's yeah. that chart? Um, let me scroll. Yeah, let me just scroll to that. Well, let me build up to this a little bit. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of information here. So for scenario two, uh, can I? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I should build up to that. Okay. It'll just be, it'll just make more sense. Okay. Um, so now we're on to that scenario two, like I talked about. We're talking about undertaking the CIP investments. I just have this table listing what our understanding of what those investments were. Um, the next thing that we talked about um, was the slip occupancy rates at area marinas. Um, as you can see from this table, the average occupancy rate from the other marinas that we looked at was 82%. Oyster Points was 77%. Um, we wanted to focus on some of the marinas that were um, in the closest proximity and were similar in, in level of amenities, and those were Oyster Koi. Oyster Cove, Brisbane, and uh, Coyote Point. Um, and the occupancy rate for those marinas was between 78 and 84. They averaged 81 percent, so slightly over um, Oyster Point's uh, 77 percent. I'm sorry, can you back up to show those, the ones you named? Yeah, they're the top three. Oh, I see. Um, they're okay. the top three in the table. Yeah. They don't have the wind problem. So it is, yeah, slightly higher there. Um, and they also, um, on average, have aging docks as well, not, not a lot of new docks there. That's another consideration that we took into account and in kind of uh, assuming that the occupancy rate at Oyster Point could begin to rival theirs. Uh, so Exhibit 20 um, s summarizes um, our assumptions about slip occupancy before dock replacement and after dock replacement. Um, uh, given the his, give, we show the historic numbers in that left-hand column and then our assumptions about the first scenario two in the right-hand column. So the overall marine occupancy, we assume, uh, bumps up to 83%, still within those ranges that we were just talking about uh, for scenario two. Uh, and you can see, them by different slip size categories, 30 and below, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, and 51 to 60. Um, I'm trying to scroll down here. Uh, then we, did, we, we looked at uh, rental rates across uh, different marinas in the area. At first, like I said, we were looking at the rate survey that was completed by uh, anchor QEA last year, or earlier this year, actually, I think. Um, <coughs> and it showed that the median rate for uh, public marinas was 808 per linear foot per month. For private marinas, it was 961. The overall average was 897. Uh, and Oyster Point's current average rate per linear foot is 811. And that's lower than the, uh, that median 897 rate, which I just quoted, but about the same as the median uh, rate for other publicly operated marinas at 808. Did you guys reconfirm the data? Uh, yes, we did. We, uh, we looked at uh, the rates at, at each of those marinas okay. as well. 
Um, here we reproduce a table from that QEA analysis. Um, they made some assumptions that we analyzed a little bit further uh, later on, and we realized that they were relying too much on San Francisco marinas, and that the rates that they assumed you could achieve post-dock replacement was a little too high. So like I said, in scenario two itself, we have this higher um, assumption, which was based on that rate uh, survey and assumption, but then scenario two and a half is the one that we think is the most realistic, and that's the one that has rate increases that are only half as great as what QEA suggested. Uh, would be possible. So you would say that um, scenario two is the most aggressive, right? Two is, a, is aggressive the because it has higher rate. rental rates and yeah, two and a half only has half of that, that assumed rate increase. Yeah. And that's aggressive without the public funds? Public funds um, don't, you know, the accounting convention that we're showing in the tables, it doesn't really uh, have an impact on this. I mean, you can move, you can allocate the public funds and show a positive uh, net income in the public um, sector of your accounting going forward. But it kind of cancels that. It cancels that across. It cancels that across both of the scenarios because the public expenses are similar. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Public funds is going to be less variable. Right. Yeah, because your public expenses, which they're intended to cover, are going to be pretty much the same in, in those scenarios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by, you, did you say scenario two point? Yeah, two and a half is just a tweak of scenario two where we only have half of the rate increase. <laughs> and that comes, that comes right after scenario two in the main report. Um, what page is that on? Uh, let's see, it's probably around. It's right here, Casey. Oh, oh, oh thanks. Yeah, 33. So just getting back um, to this comparison, so Exhibit 25 that I have up on the screen right now, uh, it compares uh, projected revenues between Scenario 1 and Scenario 2. So with the um, aggressive rate increases, not rate increases, the occupancy rate increases is, is a key driver here. Um, you have um, revenues that increase over the baseline scenario by about 68,000 in our 2019 projection, and then up to 166 in 2020. Then it jumps to around 400,000 in subsequent years. The reason there's a big jump uh, after 2020 is that there's a lot of dock replacement going on in 19 and 20, and we, we assume that a lot of slips are taken offline in those years in scenario two. So that's the, the revenue increase is not um, as great as it would otherwise be. Um, so it's a lot of detail here. I mean, uh, we also provided a copy of the model if you want to kind of look at how it works. I mean, if you're curious about that kind of stuff and what, how the assumptions all feed into each other. These are just summary tables that come out of the Excel uh, model that we, that we put together. Um, we talk about operating, the, exhibit 29 shows a comparison of operating cash flow between the two scenarios. Um, this, uh, this takes into account the depreciation assumptions that we have for each scenario. So under scenario one, uh, we have a depreciation assumption that's based on some data that uh, administration gave us. Scenario two, we add the additional depreciation that's associated with the capital improvement program investments to that. Uh, and then we, um, we add that depreciation back uh, to the net income to get operating cash flow. Um, and operating cash flow is important because um, it's really the, only the cash expenses that are key to understanding how much of a reserve you could potentially uh, build up to invest in your docs going forward. Um, so this shows, this table of the right hand column of this table shows the difference between the two scenarios in terms of operating cash flow. 
So when we compare, <laughs> this table is what you were asking about, exhibit 30. So when you compare the depreciation of the CIP investments themselves, so this is the incremental depreciation, the additional depreciation that you have in scenario two, two versus scenario one. When you compare that to the operating cash flow that you get um, in each year, and you take the difference of that, uh, it averages about 91,000 per year. So scenario two, with its aggressive assumption about pricing, and what we think is a very reasonable assumption about occupancy rates, you come up with a surplus of $91,000 in cash, um, even after taking the long-term approach to depreciating uh, what the investments that you're making. Scenario two, so this is a $91,000 surplus in scenario two. Scenario two and a half is slightly less aggressive, like we talked about, and, and we scroll down to the same table uh, where is it? So this is not yeah. scenario one. It's so a compare. That's the last it's one. it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me show you exhibit thirty four. And have, this do you have this data for the other scenarios? Yeah. Well this is uh, this is the one for scenario two and a half. This is what we think is the most realistic um, scenario going forward. Which page? Is uh, that? Uh, 30, exhibit 34. Page 32 of the. Uh, uh, page 32 of the four report. Uh, yeah, I think it's 34. 34. 34. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that was scenario two on page yeah. 34. So again, this is com this is comparing the depreciation of the capital improvement investments to the improvement in the operating cash flow versus your scenario in which you don't make the improvement, the investments. So this shows that on a cash basis, you're coming up about $33,000 short each year, which again, relative to the, to the almost $2 million in revenue from Marina is not, is not that much. And that's why I'm kind of saying it's a very, it's a marginal result. Um, from a financial perspective, it's, it's neutral whether you make this investment or not. It's not going to have a significant impact on your net income each year um, if you do it, given the assumptions that we have. And again, there are uncertainties about assumptions, but it's our, our what we think is a conservative and realistic assumption. So we think that the investment, you know, undertaking the investment, of course, with the extension of the JPA. Um, would not have a material impact on your projected net income going forward, and you'd be a, and you would essentially be able to um, reinvest in thirty years, and so it would be sustaining. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the report. Thank you. Yeah, Jason. that's the that's the last table that we had in there. Yeah. Is there any public comment on this? Yeah, we have, we have three public comments. First, from Jenny Tong. Uh, good evening to the commission. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple things that um, some of the commissioners raised, particularly about occupancy. Uh, so five years ago, I was working on an anti-eviction campaign at Pete's Harbor, uh, where over 100 people were being evicted from a public marina. Um, so those folks knew about Oyster Point Marina, and they had many reasons why they did not want to be liveaboards at Oyster Point Marina. And they said they chose Pete's for a reason, because of the weather, because of uh, proximity to um, the freeway, uh, to San Jose, um, all sorts of things. Uh, but I just wanted to bring that up to show that, uh, to reinforce some comments that were made earlier that um, replacing the docks, and I noticed that the phased replacement is gonna be over 10 years and it's gonna cost $12 million. Replacing the docks and using that to justify rate increases is not going to drive more people to Oyster Point Marina. Even your scenario 2.5 is way too optimistic. Um, and I think it's interesting because the, um, 
the report, it's, it's a great report in many respects, but I notice it says that um, there's a recommend, recommendation in there that the JPA should be renewed for 30 years. Um, so voters who aren't even born yet are going to be paying tax on this, uh, on this thing. Um, I think it's the nicest thing I can say about it. Um, so, and the reason why 30 years is recommended is because that's the only way all of these capital improvement projects can be justified. All the money that you're going to be dumping into this former dump is only justified by the benefits you can reap by tying yourself to this uh, public asset for 30 years. Um, and uh, the report does mention too that, you know, look, we have this net, you know, operating income that's kind of in the red for Oyster Point Marina, but look, it's kind of red for Pillar Point Harbor too, so, you know, you could justify dissolving the, you know, you could justify not using, uh, investing in either of them. But that's not the point. The, the public is allowed to invest money in things that lose money, like roads, schools, uh, hospitals. The public is allowed to do that and to decide what they want to spend their money in. The question in here is, is Oyster Point Marina the type of public access that deserves that investment in the way Pillar Point is? And I think that anyone who goes to either of these two locations on a non-holiday weekend on a regular basis, as I do, more at Pillar Point than Oyster Point Marina for many reasons, um, anyone can tell you that Pillar Point is more well known, it's more utilized by the public, and it justifies a public investment way more than Oyster Point Marina does. So. Um, while I respect the work that's done on this report, I don't think it's very reflective of the real situation, and um, it is for the benefit of taxpayers if the JPA is not renewed. Thank you. John Oliver. Thanks, Henry. Very good, thank you. Uh, this is an enterprise district. And this just seems like a pretty straightforward business decision. The report is actually excellent, well-written. Um, it's pretty easy to see how the conclusions were come to and then back check and see why. One suggestion I would always make for these kinds of reports is put your conclusions up front and then explain why the rest of the conclusions or why the rest of the report is necessary. If you've done so, you'll see that on page 35, paragraph K, it pretty much says it all. If you go with the optimistic uh, assumption, you'll make a little bit of extra money. If you go with the 2.5 assumption, you make a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but uh, it's a safer thing to go. From what the uh, gentleman just said, no matter what you do, the best you can hope for is to basically to chug along at the same amount of revenue as you've got now. So the way I would look at it is, you're taking a lot of risk to break even, at best. And that doesn't seem like a really smart business decision. Uh, you would expect that if you're going to take these kinds of risks to invest this kind of money as an enterprise operation, that you would have a reasonable chance of a really good payoff at the other end. Otherwise, you would allocate your money and your investments into some other sort of other area where you would more likely get some bang for your buck, such as Pillar Point. Uh, some of the things that are not discussed is what happens when we get the ec inevitable economic slowdown? It's going to happen. It could happen in six months. It could happen in two years. It could happen in ten. But there's no reason to... Uh, assume that we aren't going to have another 2008 crash. I went and checked out what the occupancy rates were of all the marinas around the town, around the bay at that time. What kind of kind of anecdotal information is probably the best I could come up with, but it looked like there was a good 10 to 15 percent drop in occupancy rates across the whole bay area within six month time frame of uh, just some bad economic news. It was pretty horrible economic news, I guess, but. Uh, it doesn't really discuss what happens if this whole Oyster Point development tanks. And there's no reason to think it won't. It's changed hands multiple times. It's been six months from breaking ground for about three decades now. And it's just no reason to assume that now you can count on it happening. So it would seem obvious that as part of your decision process that you're not going to allocate a penny toward anything out there until you've decided 
who's, you know, if there's going to be a project out there, somebody's going to prevent the place from sinking into the ground, and if somebody's going to fix the fuel box, as you know, your current plan is that somebody's going to pay that $2.5 million, and that if nobody steps forward, you're just going to shut the fuel dock down, and I suspect that would impact these numbers significantly. Thank you. DJ Thank you. <clears throat> T.J. Blothier, Moss Beach. Uh, I find the discussion we just went through painful, and I think you do too, probably. Uh, with all due respect, I think it's not a very effective use of the way that the board is conducting its, its business. You have a finance committee. I think this kind of analysis actually ought to be looked at carefully first. A uh, finance committee could <clears throat> go through that, have the discussion that we just heard, and then make a presentation to the full board and the public uh, about what the, the conclusions are in the analysis. But a lot of what we just heard was going through it at a level that, um, that isn't make the best use of your time. And I really think that that's worth your thinking about, whether it's the finance committee or it's the staff. But some kind of a, a review that then could be presented in a crisper fashion uh, with a more, more effective analysis. Um, as I look at the analysis itself, and I haven't seen the full report, just the summary, uh, it does seem like it's a valuable piece of work in the sense that it, it does say, here are the assumptions you'd have to make to be able to pay off the $10 million investment over that period of time. And so that's, that's helpful, but obviously the discussions of the assumptions is important in looking at that. I do see, though, the more fundamental problem is the question about the whole operating loss just the operating revenues uh, not covering the expenses. And according to these numbers, it's going to get worse. It's going to get close to a million dollars a year uh, just in the next three, four years, and then go up from there. Now, it may be that this investment is what's needed to bring it down to half a million dollar loss, but is that the right sort of uh, program that this, this uh, county should be investing in? Uh, I think James's comments are appropriate. The question is, should this be operating at a level that can cover its operating ex expenses or not? That's a more fundamental issue. You may have already raised that in previous meetings, but it certainly wasn't apparent from the discussion. And that, that's what I'm left with is, all right, what's the long-term plan for this? How is it going to operate? Is it on a, a basis that will work? And then does this investment make sense? The investment might but it isn't in context for, at least for the rest of us. Thanks. Catherine Slater Carter. Thank you, uh, President Matush and board members. Um, I agree with the three previous speakers, um, and some touched on some assumptions that haven't been made here. Um, if you do this investment, you're at the mercy of what South City does with the zoning. You are at mercy with the developers as to what they do and their projects happen. The underlying assumption in this is everything is going to be hunky-dory from day one. And all you need to worry about is whether people move in or not. I think there's a whole lot of um, unanswered questions at this point. And my gut feeling is that if you put the money, the same amount of money, into replacing the docks at Princeton, at Pillar Point, and were to put in um, really uh, good visitor serving facilities at Princeton, um, you would be doing a greater percentage of the population of San Mateo County. Uh, you'd be giving them a better return for what they do, what, what their taxes are, than in South City. I think the Harbor District should negotiate a contract with South City to run the harbor for them. But leave South City in charge of all of the capital improvements there. You can put the money into Pillar Point where we need it 
and do more people more good in the long run. The people who come and use, for instance, the Mavericks Road come from all over the Bay Area just to have a place where they can come on the edge of the ocean and walk their dogs and enjoy the beach and have access to the ocean. Um, I have been to the Oyster Point Marina and generally it's pretty vacant except for a few, uh, but things are going to change. And so there are going to be draws for more people to come. But you don't know what they are, you have no control over when they are. So just thinking in terms of that, I think you would do well to use this valuable report to say, eh, you know, it's not a great deal for us. But look, South City, look what you can do. That you can use this report. You won't lose any money on this and we'll run it for you and you can make, you can even increase your returns by making it an even nicer place for people to come and visit. So that's my <coughs> two cents worth, thank you. My well, staff recommendation is to receive the report, uh, unless there's any major corrections to this. Um, I'd like to receive the report. Well, I'd like to make a comment. Okay, make some comments. Um, so we are uh, supposed to be giving some direction on the report, and um, I was very interested to hear the public's comments. I thought they were very clarifying and helpful, so I want to just thank everyone for being here and for speaking, and also want to thank our consultant. Um, you know, I do think this is a good report. I do think it's useful, and I do think there's, you know, you guys worked hard on it. There's a lot of information here, so I appreciate it. Um, kind of a long story why this had, didn't get discussed in the Finance Committee. I could talk about that offline, but I agree this was a little bit tedious. Um, so I heard that point. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the Finance Committee was looking at the scenario of a management agreement. And I know that that came up and we expressed that interest to the general manager. Um, Mm, several times. So I think that scenario is something that we really ought to include here, and um, it makes sense to put it in the report. So I recommend strongly that we include a scenario for a management agreement um, where you know we do what we do well, which is operate the marina, but um, the landowner um, invests in the facility. So I think we need to add that. Um, and then, you know, as far as things that we didn't consider, if we were seriously going to look at any of these other options, um, you know, I think we would need to think about, you know, some of the things that could potentially go wrong, like an economic downturn or, you know, natural disaster, earthquake, sea level rise, and then the fact that we already know the land is subsiding because it's a landfill and it's not been made clear to this board how the subsidence is going to get addressed. And from reading the geotechnical report that was done before the JPA, it's clear that there's no known date at which time the subsidence will stop. So those are all factors and we already have a flooding problem as it is. Um, I know some of those issues are going to get addressed with the new development, but again, I've yet to see a phasing schedule for that. So that's another sort of big question mark in my mind. Um, but I think the main, the main thing I'd like to see is a management agreement scenario and then also start looking at very carefully what we could do to increase revenues and, and improve our, visiting, our visitor serving facilities at Pillar Point Harbor where we know we have a steady stream of um, users. And I think that needs to be incorporated into the thinking on this so that the board has the basis for making an informed decision about whatever direction we decide to go in. Um, so those are my recommendations on things that need to be added to this report. Oh, quick comment, I may. 
Sabrina covered most of my comments, and thank you again to the public for their comments. I'm in complete agreement that it was really painful. Sorry about that. Um, we did, as a former finance committee member, we did ask for some of the things that you're asking for now, just to remind people. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that we serve the county of San Mateo, not just Kilroy Harbor or Oyster Point. And one of the questions that came up from the public is, what's the best use of our, our money? And one of the requests of this, of the Finance Committee was to give us information so we can make an informed decision on how to do exactly that. And I think you covered it pretty well. Okay, thanks. Oh, now it works. <laughs> Sorry. How long would it take to get um, information added into this before it becomes a final report? Um, I think I'd like to clarify uh, a couple of things. Uh, <coughs> these are really the operating agreements. I think uh, the, the report could easily be changed to remove the, the phrase JPA and substitute agreement so that we can be more generic in our approach to whatever might be negotiated going forward. But I think the charge to Dornbush was clear. Um, un under what scenario um, uh, is uh, investment in our capital projects plan and uh, replacement of uh, dogs that are past their useful life or past their, their expected life cycle, life term, uh, under what terms would that be uh, feasible? And I think the report does that, and it says uh, 30 years. Um, as for investing in Pillar Point, we did not do a similar analysis of Pillar Point. Uh, we didn't uh, charge Dornbush with doing that, and I don't think that was the original intent. I think the intent was to solely look at Oyster Point, but I think it's also important to note that we're in fact further along uh, at Pillar Point in our planning for dock replacement than we are at Oyster Point. Um, recently at the board level, you reviewed a phasing plan for uh, docks F, G, and H uh, that actually adds slip uh, capacity there because uh, the board has previously recognized that Pillar Point is a uh, uh, virtually 100% occupancy and we need more slips. So we're moving forward on that project, and I think we're further along on that project than we are on anything at Oyster Point, and I don't think that uh, there's been any assumption at any point that these are mutually exclusive. We can do both uh, manage and maintain and improve Oyster Point and manage, maintain and improve uh, Pillar Point as well. Um, to add to the scope, uh, as may have been discussed, to look at what does a management agreement look like, um, I think I, I don't know, I'd have to talk offline with uh, Dornbush, or Anita could talk offline with Dornbush, but also I think we know that uh, we're going to be moving, discussing, uh, at least with South City, uh, what, we may, what any continuation of an agreement, if one were to occur, it should look like, because we are all cognizant of the fact that the current agreement expires in nine years. Um, so how long would it take to add some of that information if you wanted to? I mean, not that this is a bad report, I just, can it be made more robust? And so I, my question is, how long would it take to right. add? Like, I, and I think staff would want to talk offline with Dornbush before we get back to you on that. And I do okay. also think that there is never a report <coughs> that couldn't be made more robust. No, and I know. at some but, point we have to but somebody, say, okay, here, here's a good report. How can we use this information going forward? Right, but some of the issues that have been brought up are fair issues. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, I mean, that doesn't mean that I don't like this report. I'm just, you know, it's mm -hmm. not, you're right, no report is perfect. Mm -hmm. But um, this is the first time the full board really has had a chance to discuss right. it. And so that's why I'm just trying to see yeah. what we can do to take into consideration all of the, I mean, and we're never going to, I, I I understand that, you know, 100% of the views are not going to be 
agreeable to 100 percent of the people, but there might be some I, I, big picture things that yeah. could be added. In there. Again, certainly, I can. We the staff can talk with Dornbush offline to develop an estimate for additional out of scope work and time to complete an analysis of what an operating agreement might look like, to develop some comps. And cost, right? Because it's going to cost more to do this, is that right? Or is this a... Yes, because that wasn't part of the original right. scope, so it would be an increase in cost to the scope of the contract. And I mean, the board could authorize me at this point to negotiate that cost so that we aren't delayed in approving that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and we can... Could, could we ask, um, I'm sorry, what was your name from Dorm? Casey. Casey, yeah. yeah. Um, could, we, could we ask you, could I ask you a question? Could you get back to the podium, sorry, just so we can hear you on the mm -hmm. um, recording? So I think when you were at our finance committee meetings before the former finance committee was disbanded, um, you we talked about management agreement kind of over and over again. Um, have you guys given any thought to what it would cost to add a section on that? I haven't given a thought, given a thought to cost really. I mean, yeah, I attended one of those meetings. I know it was brought up, but it wasn't considered, yeah, as part of this, of this scope uh, particularly. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it would be just a few thousand dollars. Well, you know, wouldn't be a ma major, major investment. Yeah, it wouldn't be a major cost. To add that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to add on to that. So if you want directions, Steve, maybe we should, if the rest of the board needs to discuss it now, and give direction to negotiate with Dornbush to add some of these additional um, things to the report. In that case, I. I mean, I don't know how the rest of the board feels. I'll move for um, the general manager to negotiate with Dylan Bush to understand the cost of the add-on um, issues that have been discussed tonight, such as like management agreement or you know whatever else you all want to bring up. Um, I, I would second that. I just I think we need to maybe clarify it, but I, I like the idea. Well, I think the point is to negotiate for some extra cost. Yeah, and I think maybe there could be some discussion between Doran Bush and the general manager about some of the feedback that was provided, because there might be some other things that need to be added to the report as well that um, have been discussed tonight. In addition, I, I think the, the management agreement is a, a definite that we all agree needs to be added in as an um, alternative, but um, you know I think there might be some other tweaks and, and that sort of thing, and I'd be happy to provide additional input. I just don't want to drag the public through an even longer agenda item right now if we can avoid it. Uh, Commissioner Brennan, I've been making copious notes this evening, and uh, uh, I think I've got a clear direction that we'll look at different scenarios, different worst cases, different what ifs. We'll add in a section of operating uh, to discuss operating agreement. Uh, and your staff will talk with Dornbush, negotiate what that might look like, and if you're comfortable with that, we can proceed on that without waiting to come back to the board for approval of that revision to the contract. Well, we still have a motion on the table to give you direction to negotiate yeah. for these things. Well, in addition, I believe that uh, at our last presentation of the Finance Committee, we listed a number of things to be incorporated in the report, and I do not see this in this report. And I do think we need to look at the public benefit piece, um, and that's hard, like a lot of this, it's very hard to quantify some of that, um, but we definitely, this board needs to make a decision, and public benefit is, you know, extremely important to the decision-making process. So there's a motion on the floor. Yes, staff. 
Is clear? Do you need additional direction? Debbie, do you want to read it back? Well, I can't well, there's, a, there's a motion and a second to direct staff to uh, negotiate with Dornbush an increase in scope and cost to the existing contract to encompass the comments received this evening, specifically uh, inclusion of a discussion of operating agreement, scenarios related to uh, Unanticipated uh, negative scenarios. Um, uh, development phasing. Uh, and to clarify the impact of the phasing of the development on the potential uh, revenue and expense stream. That sounds good yeah, to me. That's the motion. In the second. I'll second. Call for roll call. Okay, and I will clarify that when I bring my screen. Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. President Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Chancarelli? Aye. I just also want to comment that I don't believe the changes we discussed prior, I'll repeat myself and say that the things we discussed in the Finance Committee are not in this current report. So I just don't want that one to be put to bed without uh, further action. Are you referring to the recent Oyster Point Committee or Finance Committee? No, I guess the previous Finance Committee. So it sounds like the in-scope work hasn't even been completed. Is that the correct assessment, Tom? Maybe it was the Oyster Point Committee. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, I thought it was the Oyster Point Liaison Committee, too. I guess this is what happens when you only have two people on all the committees. I'll re review my notes to determine the inclusion of items from the Oyster Point Committee. Right. Okay, moving on to item 13, policy regarding <coughs> continuation of unfinished business items on the agenda. May we have a staff report? Thank you, President Matouche. Um, this is this was first brought to the board last month and. Uh, we did, the board did not get to discuss it, so it, uh, it actually is sort of self-referential, I suppose, is the right term. It, it references something that happened to its own self last month. The, um, the issue of uh, the board not completing all the work on the agenda has come up. This may occur because it says in the staff report there are too many items, too many items uh, from consent, uh, for discussion, more time than anticipated spent on one or more item, the meeting was not long enough. Staff does attempt to ensure that the agenda doesn't contain more than can reasonably be expected to be heard, uh, but recognizes also that some agendas are more laden than others. Uh, last month's contained 10 discussion items. This agenda has five. Um, broken into a couple of different parts. Consent items are those that are really a normal part of the business of the district. Uh, re reports, actions, or approvals um, that are generally to, intended to be reviewed by the commission and approved as a whole. Discussion are those items where the item is of significant general interest by commission direction is sought or action is necessary. New projects, policy discussions, or unusual events and activities. So when not all items are heard, uh, in a meeting, there are a couple of options. The uh, unaddressed items can either be action, discussion, or information. And in the past, uh, if timely action is required, for example, bills and claims, staff has endeavored to ensure that the uh, commission has sufficient time at the end of the meeting to address the item. Um, if action or direction to staff is required but not necessitated at that meeting, Staff have brought the item back at the next meeting, and if the item is informational only, for example, activity reports, where the information is present in the board package, staff has not brought, brought these items back. So uh, staff believes this to be a reasonable practice, and unless otherwise directed by the commission, uh, we'll continue with that. Uh, commissioner items are of uh, uh, special interest, uh, and I think there's a uh, point of clarification. The uh, resolution 1913 
uh, addresses commissioner items on the agenda. Regardless, staff uh, does believe that this could be better clarified into an actual policy that the board approves, but it does state that any commissioner will have one item per commissioner per meeting. And in past practice, even if the commissioner items were not heard, staff will not brought them back, um, except for at this, at, the, at this meeting and the October meeting, uh, pursuant to the president's direction at the, at the September meeting. This monthly agenda includes two carryovers items from Commissioner Brennan, as well as one new and one carryover item from Commissioner Lorraine's. So uh, again, staff is seeking direction from uh, the commission. Staff will return, um, absent direction, staff will return to including any one item from any one commissioner on any one agenda. <coughs> so should the commission wish to change this practice, uh, staff requests direction to draft a policy for, adopting, for adoption, clarifying the commission's intent. So staff recognizes the issue. Staff will endeavor to craft agendas that can be managed in one meeting and to write staff reports for consent items that are sufficient to allow for those items to be uh, approved or received without discussion. Staff uh, would also uh, want, want to repeat that once these uh, board packages are published, they are online and uh, in advance of the meeting and remain online in, indefinitely. Thus, when an item is informational only uh, and not discussed, staff believes there's no necessity for returning the item in a future meeting. The staff report remains online. Um, so, uh, staff is recommending that, consistent with any direction given this evening, staff be directed to draft a policy for discussion at the December meeting that clarifies the intent of the commission related to items not heard <coughs> at a meeting. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioner comments. Are there any public comments? All right, if you'd like to have a public comment before we have James Lee on. I just like to hear the public before I comment. Unless it's a clarifying question. Good evening. I already sent a letter to the board about this item, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I just wanted to reiterate. Um, for the benefit of this meeting, uh, some of the things I said there. Um, it's true that you do have a problem getting to some, some of the items that are on these uh, agendas, but I would remind the board and the public that um, it was at staff's direction that the board meetings were cut down from 24 a year to 12. You have half the opportunities to bring an agenda item to the public, um, or in reality, have the public bring issues to you that you bring to these board meetings. So you have half that opportunity now. Um, standing committees have been cut. Um, I understand that there's going to be a future item about how um, committee meetings are not being attended. So there are even less and less opportunities for the public to be involved here. Um, also, <coughs> when you have items on your consent agenda that aren't um, either aren't prepared enough that they're, they don't raise questions among the board, they're going to be pulled, that's how it works. You can't stack a, a consent agenda and be like, well, you know, you guys keep pulling all these items. Well, if they were prepared in a different way um, and there was more consensus about how they were prepared, um, that wouldn't happen. That doesn't happen at most boards. Um, I just want to add to that um, removing items that are information only um, is a bad idea. We just saw here, you had a painful discussion about the last agenda item, but what it led to was you guys discuss, having a discussion and giving direction to staff, making a motion, passing it, and getting something done. Uh, so even if items are discussion only, the whole purpose of that is so that maybe something like that can happen again. You guys can collaborate, you guys can bring something to staff and have something occur that's a positive change um, and which, let's face it, that this district needs things like that. So if you cut those items for the sake of time and, oh, they're just, you know, they're just for FYI, you know, people can look it up in the agenda packet, you're not going to get substantive things done. So um, I would recommend that however you direct staff, um, please ensure that those items are heard and heard properly. Um, if you need to work with staff so that hey, you know, this is an informational only item, I'll, I'll promise I'll limit myself to three minutes, I'll speak for three minutes, and then I'll stop. Um, whatever you need to do, um, that's fine, but make sure that these items aren't cut. 
Thank you. I have a comment. So I've been at this commissioner business now for 11 months, and I have to say at the, at the onset, I struggled with, with how difficult it was to get things done with the Brown Act, and over time I've become, I've, I've come to more embrace it, and I feel that it's a, a very important aspect of, of what a commission has to do and how it operates. And a lot of these items that we have in this discussion agenda 13 relate to how we communicate. It's important for us to be able to communicate about items that we as commissioners think are important. And the reason we pull them from consent, or the reason we want them in discussion, is because this is the opportunity for us as commissioners to be able to discuss them amongst ourselves and with the public. So I'm, I'm a little irritated that I even have to talk about this. You know, too many items on the agenda, it, and James, you're right. We had 24, now we have 12 meetings. The issues have not gone away. We still have to cover these items. I agree with the complaints that sometimes we talk too much about a particular item. That's just what happens. We should continue to strive to be tighter with our dialogue and our information, but that's not an excuse for not covering an item. When I pull something off of consent, even if it is just a discussion item, the reason I pull it off of consent is because I, as a commissioner, think it's important to discuss it either among my peers or with the public. It's not just because I thought it was something I thought would be fun to talk about. So to just drop it because it was a a discussion item, or just simply um, something that was perceived as not important by staff, to me is ridiculous. Um, I'll leave it there for the moment. Um, thank you. So, um, I think it's important that everybody realized that anyone can pull something off consent. So it's not just the board members who can pull things off consent, but the public can actually request to have items pulled off consent as well. And that frequently happens at the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors meetings. I know someone who has pulled many items off consent. Um, and they, you know, do it for reasons that um, are well thought out and often um, anticipated by the actual supervisors. So there's no shame in pulling things off consent. And um, I've not with witnessed people on this board uh, doing it arbitrarily. Um, our meetings, frankly, typically don't run that long when you compare them to other agencies. The Half Moon Bay City Council has meetings that go till midnight and that happens frequently. Um, the city of South San Francisco has an insane number of meetings. They have special meetings constantly. Most of them are held in the afternoon on weekdays. So unfortunately, the public is not able to attend many of their special meetings. But they have all those meetings because they have so much work they're trying to get done. I mean, it's not because they have nothing better to do than go to meetings. So. Um, you know, we did cut our meetings down to, to uh, 12 a year from 24, roughly, and we do still have the same number of issues. If we want to keep moving progress forward with the district, we're going to have to meet and we're going to have to be committed to stay until we finish our packet, our agenda. Um, that hasn't been the case with this board. Uh, I think. You know, there's some commissioners that have some time constraints, and I understand that, so we try to wrap it up. But um, it is what it is, and it's only one meeting a month. And it's a commitment when you get elected that you're going to stick it out. You know, you're going to be there for, for, the, for the full agenda. So I feel really, um, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the way this staff report is written. Number one, in the background, it says, 
There are too many items on the agenda. What does that mean? I mean, if these are all important things we have to decide on, how is it too many items on the agenda? Don't we have to discuss them? I, I don't understand what that means. Number two, too many items were pulled from consent. Well, anyone can pull something from consent. So that's like some sort of weird, arbitrary opinion or something. And um, number four is the meeting was not long enough. Well, I would agree with that statement. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. If we're not finishing agendas, then the meeting wasn't long enough. Um, that's kind of how it works. So, you know, I don't really understand why we have this item in our packet. I think that our policy is clear that commissioners can request an agenda item for each meeting. And I also think it's common sense that if you don't get to all of the items on the agenda, they roll over to the next meeting. They don't just disappear into the ether as if they never existed. So that is just common sense and it, it's deductive logic. And I think our policy reads clearly on that. So because we limited our meetings to 12 a year, that cut down commissioner requests for agenda items to 12 a year, period. And it doesn't mean that if we never get to commissioner items, which are always at the very end of the meeting, that a commissioner only gets one or zero items a year because we don't finish our meeting. Um, that does not seem to be a logical way of doing things here, and that's what's been going on. So items have been disappearing, Two commissioners complained about it, so then items started rolling over recently instead of disappearing. And here we are discussing this, and you know, I, I, I think it's a waste of time. I think we should just recognize that anytime we don't finish our packet, we don't finish our homework, we don't do our full job, that we will have to roll over to the next meeting. Things don't just go away. Um, so those are my thoughts on it, and I don't really see what we need to do here. I think clearly commission requests for agenda items should roll over, and I, you know, what more do we need to know? Yeah, one, one thing I forgot to mention was that, that um, and I think this is, sometimes we try to do this, but we don't always, and that is show some respect, <clears throat> excuse me, Order the agenda items to respect the public. A lot of times we have one or two items that the public is, is here to listen to, and the others are just mostly for us to work through. If we put those up front, then you, the public, don't have to listen to us throwing on about things that you don't care about at the moment. I, I think we should work hard to schedule the items in such a way that the most interesting to the public are scheduled first in the agenda. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the minutes from May 20th, 2015, where it says one item per commissioner per meeting. And obviously, it's not common since that the items that don't get addressed in one meeting are rolled over to the next meeting, otherwise we wouldn't even be having this question. So it was a unanimous decision at that time, three, of the, and, four, and I was not on the board at that time, Commissioners Bernardo, Brennan, and Latouche were on the board at that time, and um, I'd like to know what their legislative intent was, and you know, I would like to hear what Robert's thoughts were too when he voted on this, because clearly there's ambiguity that could probably be cleared up in a more specific policy, which is unfortunate. So, you know, but that's where we are. Um, if y'all would care to address your legislative intent, I mean, I, I would be willing to listen to it and take it in, but I also would like to hear what Robert has to say. I mean, I would have no problem tabling this issue until the next meeting when Commissioner Bernardo um, who will be who's made, made up of this forum here in, from May of 2015 can weigh in as well. Um, I 
Do you have a comment? Okay. One of the things that I believe uh, kind of hamstrung us was we uh, formally started our meetings at 6 o'clock. We decided to go to 6.30. Uh, perhaps we should start uh, a little bit earlier and that will give us a little more time. So uh, one thing, it's not on the agenda tonight, but uh, perhaps consider what would it take to start your meetings at 6 o'clock to give you a little bit more time here and see if we can get through these items with that extra half hour. Uh, I'd be open to that. So I can't speak for Robert. I think he has the longest commute of all of us commuting from the Port of Oakland, um, but I do work two jobs in addition to doing this, and it is hard for me to get here earlier than 6.30. 6.30 is not easy either, and it usually means that I don't get dinner, but that's okay. Um, so I think that for working people, it's hard to show up at a six o'clock meeting because most people don't even leave work until after five, and the Bay Area traffic for those of us who work, we know it is horrendous. Um, sometimes it takes me an hour and a half just to drive to San Francisco. So um, I think those are real concerns and I think they're separate. I think it's a separate topic. I don't think this should be a negotiation between moving up our meeting time by a half hour and allowing commissioners to have one agenda item per meeting, which would mean 12 agenda items per year. Um, I, I just, I, I fundamentally feel like that is uh, not, a, um, not in the best interest of the district. And I also don't think that um, there's any reason why this board can't move forward with four commissioners here when we've been doing that all night. So sometimes somebody doesn't show up. It doesn't mean that you table something just because one person didn't show up. Um, that that seems, that could be a tactic, um, but it's not one that I think is really in the best interest of moving the district's business forward. So um, I personally would just like to clarify that when um, the board came up with this process. Um, I actually wrote the policy and it was voted for by the, I believe unanimously, that's what I heard. The intent was that there would be um, up to 24 items a year per commissioner. Um, that was the intent and that has never happened. There's never been all commissioners asking for 24 items in a year when we had um, 24 meetings a year. Or, you know, we had holidays, so we didn't always have 24 meetings, but roughly 24, 22, whatever. Um, so that was the intent. Then we dropped down to 12 meetings, and so then we cut the number of agenda items in half. Um, typically, commissioner agenda items are very fast because staff does not provide a report, and so we usually spend less than five minutes on a commissioner agenda item. Um, I can't think of a time in the last year that it's gone on beyond that. So it's not as if these items are taking up a lot of time. Uh, and I think that's an important factor. And I do agree with um, Commissioner Lorenis's point about the Brown Act. It's an opportunity for us to discuss things as a board without violating the Brown Act to try to move things forward that are of public interest. And sometimes I put things on that I think um, the public cares about and or have been asked to put on by a member of the public. Um, so I think that's, I would hate to see us go back to the way the board used to be. Um, and I, it feels like that's possibly what's happening here if we're gonna hamstring the process and if we're gonna start saying that items don't roll over. Now, that's been an issue this year. We have had a number of items and not just commissioner items. We've had agenda items that our staff has put on the agenda not roll over to the next meeting and just disappear. And I don't know of any other agency that does that. It's, it's not accepted practice. I mean, if, if it's on there and you don't get to it, then you roll it over. That's just how it goes.
Well, I'm hoping. I hope we get enough into this meeting that we can uh, go through our commissioner items tonight. And I, for one, am uh, in favor of the one item per meeting because I see that we're having trouble getting through our basic agenda meetings. So my preference will be uh, to go through our discussion items and complete our commissioner items tonight. I'm seeking clarification, not so much for tonight, President Matush, but going forward. I want to emphasize that uh, this meeting is your meeting, um, and the staff will put on the agenda what the board directs staff to put on the agenda. Um, if the wish of the board is to clarify the action of May 2015 um, into a policy, I can craft that for you um, with whatever direction you choose to give staff whether it's to uh, uh, 12 items a year, 24 items a year, um, whatever your wish is, or just that everything rolls over, uh, whatever your wish is. I've tried to lay out the issues as I see them, uh, but again, I want to emphasize that this is your meeting, and uh, if I can get direction, I'd be happy to do that. I think that uh, I interpret one meeting per item per one item per commissioner per meeting one way, and clearly uh, Commissioner Brennan and Commissioner Lorenas interpret it differently. I would like clarification, and I'm happy to implement whatever direction I'm given. Commissioner Jane Crawley. So I want to just say that I'm not espousing any tactic. I like to do complete research as much as I can, and that's the only reason I, I bring up Commissioner Bernardo, because this was a unanimous decision. I am not trying to hamstring the process, but um, the fact that we're even having a discussion like this at all shows me that there's got to be some clarification. So, Steve, if you think... I'm, I would be willing to have you draw up some um, policies based on the discussion you had tonight and bring them back to the December meeting so we can vote on those. I'll make, so that, I mean, that's, are you making a motion? I'm, I'm, I can, if I may, oh, Commissioner Brennan, I'll draft a policy and I'll put alternatives in that policy so that the board uh, can look at it in December and decide which direction they want to go. I mean, if that's the direction, I'm, I don't know if we need a motion, but I mean, I don't care if it's a motion or not. I think that's the direction we should be giving you so that we've got options based on um, all the input that we've gotten tonight and so that there's clarity in the future as to what this policy is so that it's not left up to interpretation. So I think we need to get clarity on this. Um, because I'm still confused. So I'll go ahead and make a motion that we uh, draw up a policy. A few policies based on whether it's 12, 24, whatever. I mean, that's, that's, I would like different choices based on what we had discussed tonight and based on public comment. Uh, that's confusing to me. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Chan Crowley, I could also point out that if I'm directed to draft a policy, um, uh, if Commissioner Brennan makes a motion and, and uh, I'm directed to draft a, a policy with one option, it's the uh, perfect purview of the board to amend that policy in a future meeting when that policy is getting adopted. So I don't need to, I, I didn't intend to unnecessarily confuse things by presenting them okay, too many helps. options. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Sorry for the interruption, Commissioner Brennan. Yeah, that Thanks. Sorry to be obtuse. So, what I think you folks are dis discussing is the intent of that language, which said at that time it was 24, but now we're 12 commissioner items per year, versus Twelve 
commissioner items except when we don't get to them and then they just disappear. I, th I think I'd have to say that there are s statements that are not necessarily all uh, intentionally connected. There used to be 24 regular meetings. There are now 12 regular meetings. There is a resolution that says one item per commissioner per meeting. Those are right. three independent statements and how you connect them is up to you and I think that's what staff is seeking clarification on so that we can draft a relevant policy <coughs> that clarifies the connection between those three statements. So what recommended motion do you have in mind? Uh, I don't, Commissioner Brennan. If you've got something you would like to see crafted and make that motion, I will craft that policy and bring it back to the board's discussion. Uh, did you have a recommended motion? You're talking. Yeah. So, um, I think my, my motion would be to have the general manager craft a policy based on what we talked about today. You know, whether it be. I, Request that you be a little more specific okay, so, if you could please reach in early. So um, the, the one, okay, so the current policy is um, one item per commissioner per meeting. And that's fine with me. I mean we can keep it like that and or add on um, and those items that have not been discussed would be carried over to a future agenda item. So you want the future agenda as, a, as, a, as a, an agenda item on the future, another as an item on the future agenda, same if you carry over. So your motion, to I understand, is that each commissioner gets one agenda item per meeting, and if that if we don't get to that item, it gets rolled over to the next meeting. Yep. So they will get twelve items per year. Uh, well, that, if I mean, they it want still it. has to be discussed at the next meeting. So yeah, but that would be the could, could I ask a question to assist the general manager in helping you? When a, an unheard item rolls over to the next meeting, the question that the general manager is seeking direction from the board on, and I don't think he's expressed that he has a dog in this fight. He just really wants to know what you want. Mm -hmm. Is whether that rolled over item becomes the one item per commissioner on that meeting, or does it mean that the commissioner gets the rolled over item plus another item presented for that meeting? That is the issue. And so that, and then if neither of them are heard, do they both roll over, or is there now an opportunity for a third for the following meeting? That is the question. Right now, there's a a policy that says one item per commissioner per meeting. Why can't we amend the, the policy right now? Uh, no problem. Let's amend. Let's make a motion to amend the policy, and that way we don't have to do this all over again. So. I think that's yeah. not the item that's on the agenda. Uh, I suppose it's, it's possible. Uh, of course, it's possible. What's? I will make a motion that we amend the. That we amend the policy to clarify that each commissioner gets one item per meeting, 12 items per year, and if an item is not heard due to time constraints, that item rolls over to a future, to the next, to the following meeting. As that one item, or does that commissioner get two? That, the, the commissioner, the I was totally clear on that, let me restate it, because I, I thought I was clear, but I wasn't. The, each commissioner gets 12 items a year. If for some reason the board does not finish their packet, their agenda for the evening, that item would then roll over to the next meeting, but it would not preclude the commissioner from having an, a new agenda item at the next meeting so that they can have a total of maximum 12 items per year. No more, just 12. So that is that motion clear? Can I get a can second? I, if can I try to restate that? Sure. That each commissioner gets one 
new item per meeting in addition to any rolled over items from earlier meetings up to a maximum of 12 items per year. Okay. Does that... It's the same I'm, thing. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's essentially I, the I'm, same thing, right? Yes. It's not I, any I, I think I said what you said. Yeah. yeah. Does that... Debbie, have you got that? Well... <laughs> <laughs> which version? <laughs> Basically, the gist that each commissioner will get one new item per meeting, 12 items per year, with a rollover um, to the next meeting. Is that? And I'll get a verbatim in the Okay. Now, is there gonna be any further confusion with this? Because what if you come back and say, well, an item rolled over, but uh, then at that next following meeting, none of the commissioner <coughs> items were heard, so then two items are rolling over. Do we have to clarify that also? No. Okay, Miller says no, so it must be that way. All right, so I think we're clear on the item. Can I get a second? I mean, the, the um, motion. Can I get a second? Okay, we got a second. There's no further comments. We'll call for a roll call. Okay. Commissioner Bernard Clark, not here. Commissioner Chancarelli? No. Commissioner Matouche? No. Commissioner Lorenez? Yes. Commissioner Brennan? Yes. Motion fails for lack of a majority. So, shall we just like to restate this? <clears throat> I'm fine with moving on. Yeah. We've been on this for a while. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's dead. The, the uh, approval of the board, rather than receiving a staff report, to simply uh, approve item 14, or would anybody like to discuss it without a staff report? Public. The item 14 is the contract with Deborah Glasser, uh, Labor Relations for contract negotiation. I'd like to make a comment. Okay, please make a comment. So, this is if my understanding of this is that we're just you, the staff is suggesting that we just go with the contractor that we used before. It, it, and I've, I've said this before with respect to other contractors. I see this as an opportunity to, to ask a few other folks that can do the same kind of work to weigh in on how they would do it. It's an opportunity for us to learn a little bit about the process and maybe, maybe reduce the cost, but more importantly to me is just hear what other organizations come up with. Does that make sense? Uh, it does make sense, um, Commissioner Lorenz, but we've only used this contractor once before, mm -hmm. and uh, they have a lot of experience and knowledge of our district's needs and have worked with our two unions, so I think they have special experience that we could benefit from. Plus, it's already November, and these MOUs expire in June, and it takes several months to okay. negotiate last time this contract was supposed to be a one-year contract it ended up taking two years so I've been you know for that for those reasons I would recommend that yes next year maybe we can do an RFP but this year we go with this contract. okay I think that would that would be helpful it's just a, a good practice I think to, to look at other vendors I agree. yeah I just want to comment too but I think um, Commissioner Crawley was ahead of me um, so, based on the negotiations we went through last year with um, the two bargaining units, I thought that uh, Ms. Glasser did, like. did a great job and um, we had a great negotiating team. So, I am perfectly comfortable with this and if we want to move forward within the following year to or for the next negotiation to do an RFP, that's fine. But right now, I think we're here and Deborah Glasser did a an excellent job. Okay. Um, 
So, do we have the um, the cost of Deborah Glasser services last year? Is that in here? I, I missed it. I think. Yes, it's in there. Um, it ended up costing a total of fifty-five thousand. I'm sorry, how much? Approximately fifty-five thousand. She charged us last time. Over two years. Yes. Fifty-five thousand. Yes. Okay. I saw fifty-five thousand in here, but I thought that was. Is that what you're projecting for this year? No. This uh, proposed contract is for twenty-five thousand. She expects to. Um, if if it turns out that we need additional funds, we would. Uh, uh, you know, negotiate. <coughs> have to amend the agreement at that point. But um, right now, the proposed contract is for 25000 mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that we have a labor negotiator, because when I first got on this board, the district did not have a labor negotiator, and we hadn't had one in I don't know how long. Um, so I think it's definitely an important function. So I definitely support hiring someone to help us with that, um, it's necessary. However, um, I do think that we need to look at other negotiators, and I think that's a really healthy process to go through because, um, especially for like new people on the board, they learn about the process through interviewing negotiators and finding out you know, their different approaches to how they handle things. And um, I know that we got a lot of well, I'll just say we got some pushback from our employees the last time we went through this, and there were some unhappy people, and I know it's it can always be difficult, um, but my concern mainly was with the fact that um, I did not feel that our negotiator explained things clearly, and so I felt like there was a, not necessarily enough of an interest in bringing the board members along and understanding the process and some communication breakdowns. I think that also had to do with maybe management's approach to how the board is communicated with, but um, I expect that the negotiator is going to answer questions and it's a very complicated process. So for people who have not been involved in it before and since, you know, in the, Previously, it was just um, the staff was negotiating, and there really was no negotiation, frankly. Um, so this was my first real time going through a negotiation was with Deborah Glasser. I, I made it really clear to her that I needed to be educated about how all, all of it worked, and, um, and that just did not happen. So I was incredibly disappointed with the process. Um, because I just didn't feel like I had enough information to vote. And I don't think that's the result that we were hoping for. So that was my experience with it. I, I don't think the rest of the board necessarily shared my experience. Um, but for that reason, I can't support this. Um, but I definitely support going out for more um, you know, options next time around just so we can see, you know, see how other people do it. And I think it would help me learn too. So I know it's not her job just to be my teacher on this, but when you're asking people to make decisions that affect the fate of your employees, I think we have to take it really seriously, and I think we better understand it and know what we're doing and be conscious of those decisions. So thank you. Mr. Chankwell. So Steve McGraw, I want to thank you for at least bringing Deborah Glasser to us because when I talked to her without going into details of any closed session information, I thought she was very well versed on what we needed, what we wanted. No negotiation is going to be perfect for either side. That's the whole purpose of a negotiation. No contract is ever going to be perfect and you know accepted fully from either side. But um, I felt that Deborah Glasser was very attuned to the issues, at least that I brought up, and so I'm perfectly comfortable with this. And I'll make a motion to approve the contract with Deborah Glaser, Labor Relations LLC, with an estimated cost of twenty-five thousand dollars, based on the hourly rate shown um, in this report, and authorize the general manager to execute this agreement. Um, and that would be the first motion. Um, 
and to appoint her, Steve, you, and Anita to be the negotiating, negotiating team for um, the contract negotiations. Well, in spite of what Anita said, uh, I respect my fellow commissioners uh, wanting to get competitive bids, but under the timeline uh, that we're under right now, I uh, would respectfully request that we approve this and we go through the process of RFP uh, the following negotiating uh, session. But at this time, because of where we are in the negotiating table, I'm going to second that motion and hope that uh, I get some support from fellow commissioners. President Matusha, if I may, I'd just like to clarify for the record one of the comments that Commissioner Chan Corrales made. Uh, I appreciate your recognition of staff, but uh, Deborah Glass was already on board when I joined uh, the Harbor District team, and then uh, she was hired by the board as a result of a request for proposals that did solicit a number of proposals, and the board selected. Her. I had nothing to do with bringing her on board. Well, thanks. But thanks for the credit. Thanks for the clarification, but I know that y'all worked very well together. So maybe that's why I thought that you helped bring her on. And you got on the board. You were hired before I got on the board, so. Yes, any further discussion? No. Do we have a roll call? Commissioner Brennan? No. Commissioner Shankarelli? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. Commissioner Matouche. Aye. Great. Thank you, fellow commissioners. Item 15 is a forum of the commission at a committee meeting, committee of the whole. Staff report, please. Thank you, President Matouche. Uh, this is another item uh, that is um, solely within the, the purview of the board, and uh, again, these this commission meeting and the committee meetings are yours to run as you see fit. So uh, that's why the recommendation is to uh, receive the report and provide direction to staff on whether to draft a policy that would allow for a quorum of the board to attend committee meetings. I referenced several uh, policy implications of this. The, uh, the Brown Act has been mentioned. It's in a section of the government code, district ordinance district policy, the policy on standing committees, and Robert's Rules of Order. So uh, fundamentally the issue is that uh, on this board, five members of the board comprise the commission. Uh, thus three of this board is a quorum of the board as a whole. Uh, and this board appoints uh, two members to standing committees. For the Brown Act, a standing committee is a legislative body. Uh, and uh, is subject to the requirements of the Brown Act, and the Brown Act is very clear and very specific, where it says that a quorum of the board may not attend, or a, a, a third member of the board, in this instance, may attend a standing committee meeting, but may not participate in that meeting. And uh, the reason this is coming before you is because I heard from uh, a couple of commissioners that this is a item that would like to, uh, uh, commissioners would like to be able to attend uh, standing committees of which they are not a member. Not just attend, but participate. Not, not just, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller, not just attend, but participate in the meeting. Attendance is already allowed. Um, so the Brown Act, as I said, states that the quorum of the commission is allowed, but uh, uh, the, the third commissioner is, is not allowed to participate. And Yet the district ordinance says that the district should be governed by the latest edition of Robert's Rules of Order, which is actually the 11th, edi 11th edition. 11th edition, currently. Um, our district policy on standing committees is silent on the matter of a third uh, member of the board attending a committee meeting. Robert's Rules of Order states that a committee may, in the presence of additional commissioners, become a committee of the whole. Uh, in that instance, a quorum of the board would not be the board, but would be the committee, but a committee of the whole. So it doesn't confer upon that committee the decision-making abilities uh, of the board as a whole. 
uh, the committee is still governed by the noticing of the Brown Act, and it is a, would be a requirement in that instance that the agenda <coughs> of the meeting be published as uh, uh, notifying the public that should a quorum of the board attend, then the committee meeting shall be considered a committee of the whole. Uh, an example was provided, and that's the uh, Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation uh, District, and uh, one of their committees agendizes their uh, committee meetings as shown uh, in the staff report. Uh, this board is five members, a quorum is three, that's an addition of uh, one person above and beyond the, the uh, committee. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but that's why I say it may be relevant that the Golden Great District uh, comprises 19 members, with uh, uh, my understanding of seven members on the Building and Operating Committee, plus the, the, the President sort of an ex officio. So um, to get from the seven to uh, a quorum of the 19 would be an additional three commissioners. Um, there are other examples. For example, I was recently at a mid-pen open space uh, meeting. Uh, this was a public uh, workshop put on by staff. And uh, the notice for that meeting said, this is a public open house, which may include a quorum of the board of directors, no formal action will be taken. But it was not a meeting of the board or a committee of the board, it was an open house put on by staff. That is also, uh, in that instance, specifically allowed under another section of the Brown Act that allows a quorum of the board to attend public meetings, to attend the meetings of other legislative bodies uh, when there's a matter of uh, interest to the board to attend trainings, to attend social events and the like. Um, so, should this commission desire to allow for the participation of a third commissioner at a committee meeting, um, staff would request that uh, we be directed to draft a policy to allow that. I think it's clear in, in the example used, the Golden Gate Bridge District, that their bylaws specifically uh, allow for this and then uh, they then notice that on agenda. So I would request clarification from the board. Um, and that, that clarification uh, that would be uh, embodied in a policy would be uh, whether the board is saying that that would apply to all meetings of all committees, or would the policy simply allow a committee to make a determination as to whether its committee meetings should be considered as committees of the whole. I think it's also important to also address, though, that it then becomes incumbent upon the public to pay a lot more attention to committee agendas than they may have been attending in the past, because now a substantial amount of discussion about an issue may be conducted by uh, a majority of the board at a meeting that is not agendized and publicly noticed as a meeting of the board. So I think that that's a consideration uh, that should be taken into account. I think it's clear that the intent of the Brown Act is to ensure that the decision-making process is clear and open to the public. And while it's recognized that any committee of the whole is not meeting as the board, is not making decisions, uh, I think it could be construed that as part of the uh, deliberative process is the discussion that may happen in that instance. However, uh, again, uh, Golden Great Bridge District does this. There may be others. I haven't been able to find an example of any five-member boards uh, that do this. Um, and I will reiterate that this, these board meetings and these committee meetings are committee meetings of, are meetings of the board and the committees. And uh, staff will uh, draft the requisite policy as as directed. And with that, we have to take any questions uh, from the board. Commissioner, comments or questions? Well, I um, I would say that first of all, I'd like to come clean. I'm the person, one of the commissioners, that asked you to do this. We've had some long discussions about this, and I'd like the public to know my intent for asking for this. It is my opinion that the Brown Act 
is an important part of how we operate and its intent is for open government to make sure that commissioners are open in their discussions and in their deliberations and and in the way they make decisions. When we have committee meetings, and in my case, I'm the I'm in the uh, sand replenishment committee. I was in the finance committee, and from my point of view, if a fellow commissioner felt they would they had some relevant input into the items that were being discussed at a committee meeting. I would welcome them because, in, in my view, the discussion coming from a fellow commissioner in the public view is an important aspect to how we make decisions and, as you found out today, when we were going through some of the finance with Oyster Point, it takes a long time to go through some of these things. So only if you are a member of the public and you are really interested in this will you be at, at a meeting like this. The summaries of such a meeting would come to the to the whole board later. So to me, it's very important, just as a matter of open open government, to allow the commissioners who want to speak and ask questions at a committee meeting where the experts are going to be discussing this work. It's very important for me to have them to find a mechanism by which they can operate within the within the Brown Act. So thank you for bringing this. I think Commissioner Frawley had something. I don't know. No, I thought I'm just going to see if we had a public comment. I thought no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we do. James Holland. Would you like me to come on now? Yes. Um, hello again. I just, uh, maybe this is something staff could clarify, but I just want to understand better what what's meant by not participating. Does that include commissioners being unable to make a public comment as a member of the public at a meeting? Um, uh, if that's the case, um, then I see some benefit in this uh, proposed policy. If not, um, and uh, commissioners are able to just make a public comment, I don't see why anything needs to be changed. However, I do want to bring up the fact that, um, and I think Commissioner Lorenas is going to talk about this later, but with the lack of um, attendance at committee meetings, I think it would be really helpful for this policy to be in place, at least for those meetings where there aren't two committee members who are able to attend. Um, this would help to ensure that these committees actually meet, actually get stuff done. Um, and uh, to that end, I think it would be important for not only committee assignments to be made, but also alternates <coughs> to be assigned to these committees um, to ensure that work gets done. Um, and uh, that's essentially it. Thank you. So he had a question in there. Did you want to clarify it for him? So putting aside policy, the Attorney General has on more than one occasion opined that a member of a board who is not a member of a standing committee may attend that meeting of the standing committee on which he or she is not a member, but may not participate in any way, including may not make public comment. Great, thank you. And I'd also like to clarify that the we have a lot, we have a number of standing committees. Maybe we should just say what they are right now. We have the um, Oyster Point Committee, which is Commissioner Matouche and Karali. We have the Finance Committee, which is Commissioner Matouche and Karali. We have the Oyster Point Liaison Group, which is not a standing committee, which is Commissioner Matouche and Karali. And I think we have the Sand Replenishment Committee, which is uh, Commissioner Lorenus and Commissioner Bernardo. And those are the only committees that I'm aware of at this time. There was a Water Quality Committee, but Commissioner Matouche, as board president, 
um, killed the water quality committee, so we don't have that any longer. And we have a strategic planning committee, but that is not a standing committee, that is an ad hoc committee, which rarely ever meets. Um, so that's the committee makeup right now. Did I miss one? Well, who's on, can you remind us who's on the um, strategic plan? Is you and Tom? Or? Tom and I are on that committee and we met <coughs> recently, but I think that's the only time we've ever met. And it was just to, in advance of hiring the strategic planner. So now it's sort of, that committee sort of not inactive. Um, and again, that's an ad hoc committee, which is not subject to the Brown Act requirements as the standing committees are. It's unclear what kind of, I mean, the, the Oyster Point liaison group is a rather bizarre group. It's not a committee, and it's not technically, if you read the JPA, it is not a committee. It's a group. Um, so. It's basically talking heads. They're, they're not even allowed to give advice to the board per the JPA. So it's a very odd group. If you read the JPA, you'll be fascinated because it's, you have to read the amendment when they changed what that group is supposed to do. Um, it's kind of in the weeds. But anyway, um, you know, I think that the idea here is that there are people that want to participate on committees that are excluded from doing that because um, they can't speak because they're not on the committee. I'm one of those people. So I used to be on the finance committee and um, Commissioner Matouche removed me from the finance committee. I still don't know why, except that he said at the meeting where he removed me, I quote, actions have consequences. I've yet to hear what the actions were that had the consequences, but that was all I was told. Um, that was a committee I founded, and um, I'm very um, interested in continuing to be part of the process with the Finance Committee, and was very disappointed to um, not continue to be on it, because I worked really hard on building it, along with Commissioner Lorenus, and we had great public participation. There was a lot of interest, and the staff was really involved with it as well, and that's how we got the whole um, kind of thinking about the report that we heard earlier uh, regarding OPM going was through discussions with staff, and of course those meetings were open to the public and well attended. Um, I, If I was still on the Finance Committee, I would really embrace the idea of having the full board there if they're interested because I think sometimes you, you have an opportunity to go into detail with someone like a consultant, say the guy from Dornbush this evening, um, in a way that you can't at a bit or you shouldn't at a meeting like this where the public doesn't necessarily, they're not there for that item, they don't want to go into all the detail. Um, it gives you a chance to really get better educated. And so to have those types of meetings open to the full board to show up and ask questions so that we're all educated, I think is super useful. And so I would support um, having committees of the whole. Uh, I think it's a great idea, and I know that there are other agencies besides Golden Gate, um, whatever, Bridge District or whatever they're called. Um, there are a number of other agencies that do this. Also, there are city councils that have committee meetings where the whole city council participates um, or whoever's interested. So it's not uncommon, and I, I can't imagine why we wouldn't want to do it. I think it's, tr it's more transparent or just provides another level of transparency and participation. Um, and I think it's good for the board, good for the public, good for the district. Um, so those are the reasons I support it. Um, I also think we need to look at our committees in general and figure out how to make them more productive. I think that's always a good thing to do. So those are my comments. I have one more comment. Just thank you for that question, James. Um, I would just like to give you a specific example. In the sand replenishment meeting, Commissioner Bernardo and I are part of that, that sand replenishment committee. So when we, have a, when we meet, we're missing the input from from someone in the commission who operates a, a boat in in Philip Point Harbor, our president, and 
I would imagine he would have valuable <coughs> input into this committee, but he will, he's not allowed, to, at the, in the current status, he is not allowed to come to that meeting and interact with us. He can sit and listen and can't offer any, any words of wisdom. So should we be, if we were able to operate as a committee of the whole, he would be allowed to come to the meeting and provide input, and I think that's valuable. And I, for one, value the input from my fellow commissioners, and I'd like to see this as a mechanism by which our committees can receive that input and have a dialogue. I guess I listened to what uh, General Manager McGraw said about <clears throat> the Mid-Peninsula type meetings, where you could call for an open house, anybody could attend, anybody could make comments. The whole idea of a committee of a whole getting together to discuss something and not being able to enact business seems uh, somewhat odd to me. Uh, the idea is to try and make decisions. Uh, I would advocate rather than uh, a committee of the whole that if you have a concern, whether it's uh, beach replenishment or anything else, we have uh, somebody like we asked the general manager to set up a public round table or whatever he was referring to have a special meeting where anyone, all the commissioners and the public could attend and make any and all the comments they want. <clears throat> the idea of uh, having more committee meetings where we can do nothing just strikes me as rather non-productive. Thanks, Tom. So really the standing committees make recommendations it's always going to come back to the board for a discussion for, and for a vote. So, I mean, I, I echo what um, Tom said. I, I just, you know, that, that's my opinion. Um, also, you know, we earlier had a discussion about people making it to an, an earlier meeting by moving this meeting up 30 minutes. So, I, you know, why, I mean, do you think that you, and I don't know, I don't know your schedule, so would you, would, how many of you actually go to another meeting if it's during the day? I mean, maybe that's not the issue. But for me, really, the issue is before anything is voted on, the full board will discuss it. And so the full board will have a time to, or the time to um, weigh in their opinions, their thoughts, and, you know, but I think the committee work is, um, should be focused, and I mean, I'm going to be perfectly blunt here because I think I'm the chair of the, well, I don't think I'm basically the chair of the Finance Committee, and we had a great committee meeting that got a lot of things done with regard to the reserve policy, and um, I think that's going to be coming back on the agenda in December, and I've been to other Finance Committee meetings, and I didn't think that they were as focused as they should have been, and that's not a knock on the um, finance committee as much as the scope to me for a finance committee should be pretty narrow in terms of dealing with our finances, our reserves. And yeah, I mean, you can bring up other agenda items and put it on the board agenda and we can discuss other things like, you know, legal fees or whatever, but I just didn't think that the finance committee before were as focused as they should have been, which is why I voted for the scope this last well, the scope that um, got we voted on a couple of meetings ago. So, because I thought that was more narrow. So that, uh, that's my opinion, and I, I would just keep with what we're doing and, um, you know, follow the Brown Act, and th this should pl apply to all of our um, meetings of all of our standing committees. I mean, yes, the Brown Act asks for transparency, but the Brown Act also was enacted to prevent backroom deals from being made, you know, and that's the reason that there's a limited number of elected people or anyone who's got a straight line to an elected body to convene like that. So, I mean, I think that there's a whole, unless we have a whole Brown Act lesson, which I'm open to, I mean, I, I hear the transparency issue, but there are other parts of the Brown Act that I think could easily be abused with by changing this. So that's just my opinion. And, I would support, like I said, that we continue as a district to um, adhere to the Brown Act and that this should apply to all of the meetings for the board and all of our committee meetings. Commissioner, uh, President Matusia, if I may interject, it's 925. Uh, 
if I could hear either a motion to extend the meeting or a discussion of bills and claims. I move, I move that we extend the meeting another 15 minutes. Second. You know, I'm going to, uh, this is a prime example of a short agenda where we had so much discussion we can't take care of basic simple business items. However, I really wanted to get to the commissioner items. We tried that before and uh, I will vote in favor of extending the meeting 15 minutes. We have a couple of things that we have to do to get through this, but it's distressing to have simple little things and information items that can't even be presented because we're running out of time. We are not running out of time. You are running out of time. <clears throat> I thought, okay. That's your so the issue. Motion and a second to extend this to 9:45. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Uh, roll call. Uh, President Matouche. Aye. Commissioner Lorenz. Aye. Commissioner Shankarali. Aye. Commissioner Brennan. Aye. Um, I'd like to comment on this. Um, I just want to talk about the elephant in the room here, and um, you know. The lack of support for something as simple as having a committee of the whole so that if additional board members want to participate in committee meetings, as I've expressed that I would like to, especially in light of my being removed from the finance committee, um, what is really happening here is our board president is blocking me from being a member of the board who can participate on committees. He has removed me from my committees and he is now in favor of supporting something that blocks me from any participation on committees. This is retaliation. This is what retaliation looks like and I have really reached a tipping point with that. Um, I am very, very disappointed with <coughs> President Matouche and his behavior and his consistent retaliation and this business about the meeting time, we don't have a hard stop at 9.30. This is fiction. This is apparently to do with his bedtime and I'm, I'm fed up with it. So I just, that's all I have to say about this. Uh, the board has adopted right or wrong a policy <coughs> calling, stating that meetings must end at 9.30 unless the majority of the board votes to extend We that. can vote, we can vote to extend meetings by an hour. If Absolutely, you, want. you can vote to extend as, it, as do long as you other like, but, boards. It's, but it's not a, it's, it's actually not a fiction, it's a, it's a board adopted policy, and it's your policy to change as you see fit. It is not required that we end our meetings at 9.30, that was my point. Well, it's required by your policy. We can extend the meetings beyond 9.30, so there is no hard stop if we want to extend the meeting. I agree with you. Okay. Can the Council. Okay, what are we doing? Okay, so uh, we've got Committee of the Whole on the floor, and we've got to do bills and claims, and potentially item 16. Uh, and I hope that we can do this quick enough. I would like to make a motion that we direct staff to develop a policy to allow the board to have committees of the whole. Is that worded correctly, Steve? Does that make sense? The one item I would add to that motion would be and that either this policy applies to all committees all the time or that each committee makes its own determination. But it's got to be the overarching board, and then you either sort of punt that decision to the committees or you, the board applies it to all committees. Why wouldn't you just do it on an as-needed as basis if you knew that additional commissioners wanted to attend? They just let you know, and then you develop the agenda based on that information. But if there's but if there's an overarching policy, you don't need to let me know. You can just show up. If well, we don't even need a policy. We ought to be able to let you know as it is and just have a committee of the whole. I mean, I don't even know why we have to have this agenda item. I think it's a waste of our time. A staff in, at other agencies doesn't have policy on this. They just adapt to the situation. 
So if I could jump in, um, I'm sorry you think it's a waste of time. I, I think uh, I, I just don't agree that at other agencies, staff adapts to the situation and allows for a majority of the board to uh, uh, appear at a, and participate in a committee and automatically convert something to a committee. We've done preferable, it before. Preferable, since we finished, preferable would be for the board <clears throat> to adopt a policy that allows for that to happen in the circumstances when it's necessary. We, it's, we not, actually, it's not for your general manager to decide on the fly what should happen with regards to the committees. It's for you as the commissioners to decide what rules you would like to put in place. Well, that may be, but we have actually had committees of the whole in the past. So there is a history of that. We've also had meetings that were not special meetings noticed so that the whole board could show up. And I have an email from you about that. So it's not as if we haven't done this, but now suddenly we need a policy about it. Um, so anyway, I'm fine with making a motion to develop a policy if that's what you think you need. Do I need to restate it? Yes. Debbie, do you have it or should I, do you want to read it? To develop the policy of the, um, the committee as a whole. Is that right? Looks like Steve's going to say something. Which Steve? <laughs> uh, Steve Hem. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm clear on the intent of the motion. Is everybody clear on the intent of the motion? Do you want me to restate it? I'm, I'm clear. Okay, so can I get a second? I'll second. Roll call. Okay, Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. President Batouche? No. Commissioner Chancarelli? No. Okay, moving on to item 16. <coughs> uh, Commissioner Matush, would you mind, could we jump back to consent yes. and take care of bills and claims and possibly even the um, commercial activity program with Donald Smith? Right, we uh, pulled Commissioner Brennan wished to pull item 1. So, uh, going to bills and claims item 1, Commissioner Brennan. Thank you. I would just like to point out that we have another bill from Hanson Bridget that's $34,363. Um, we are spending a lot of money on legal fees, so I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that. Thank you. Any other comments? Motion to approve item one. I'll move to approve. Roll call. Commissioner Chancarelli? Aye. President Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. And was that the item nine you were referring to? Yeah. Yes. Okay, item nine, uh, commercial activity permit for Donald Smith to rent his privately owned vessel at Oyster Point Marina. Uh, Mr. Moran, staff report. This is a motion to approve the commercial activity permit for Donald Smith, a current tenant, to rent his privately owned vessel for day trips at the Oyster Point Marina until December 31, 2018, and authorize the general manager to execute the permit in a form approved by legal counsel. <coughs> the permittee is a current tenant at OPM and is requesting approval to conduct business uh, at the marina pursuant to the terms and conditions of this cap. Permitty will be allowed to rent his 30-foot vessel, owned and insured by him, to qualified and screened individu individuals for day trips between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., seven days a week. Consistent with the San Mateo County Harbor District's goal of promoting and providing services to the local and transit voting, voting community. No overnight guests uh, or use will be permitted. Uh, the cap is free freely terminable, terminable, terminable by the district if terms are violated. Permittee may allow persons renting his vessel to access the dock only when escorted by him to and from the vessel. Permit permittee will not provide dock restroom keys to his customers. Permit permittee will not or will be responsible for keeping the entire area constantly clean and ensuring no potential environmental hazards occur. Permittee has provided a copy of current business license, proof of U.S. military prior service, 
and boat rental insurance with the dis district listed as additional insurer. The commercial activity <coughs> permit application fee of $258 would be waived due to the applicant's prior U.S. military service, consistent with the district rate and fee schedule. Permittee will provide a $500 deposit and be responsible for a $2.32 per passenger fee. Staff recommends the board approve the commercial activity permit for Donald Smith, a current tenant, to rent his privately owned vessel for day trips at the Oyster Point Marina until December 31, 2018, and authorize the general manager to execute the permit in a form approved by legal counsel. This item was pulled by Commissioner Moranis. Commissioner Moranis. Well, first of all, thank you for a very strong staff report. The reason I um, I pulled it was because of the, um, the fee waiver due to military service. I think that's part of our policy and it's fine, but it struck me that we should review the, um, this policy and, and have a discussion where we just may want to add other groups. For example, disabled individuals, just, just as a random example. I think it'd be a worth, worthy discussion to not just single out military, but other groups that may also be worthy of being, <coughs> excuse me, be worthy of such a waiver. That was it. I, I have a quick comment. Um, I This did strike me as odd, and it's not the first time I've seen this come up, so I don't want this particular person to feel singled out, and I'm sorry this may have gotten delayed a little bit, but, um, uh, it's, you know, if we're going to have a policy that favors one group over another, I think we need to understand why we have that policy. And this policy apparently was developed probably a really long time ago. Um, I don't know the origin of it, but, you know, if we're going to be providing these types of fee waivers, um, I think we have to do it in a thoughtful way, and if we're going to do it for um, people that served in the military, then what about, you know, I think the disability point is a good point, but, you know, what about seniors or single mothers or, you know what I mean? Like, you could infinite, there are infinite possibilities there. So I think, you know, we need to, to think about what we're doing here. It just feels like it's not even-handed, and that um, doesn't sit right with me. So I think we need, you know, it's old and policy, and we need to revisit it. So I'd like to ask staff if they could bring that policy back to the board for consideration. It doesn't affect my decision on this tonight, but I think it's a good time to look at that. Uh. I think that we have been talking internally about bringing some <coughs> elements of rates and fees back to this board when we do mid-year budget review, and certainly if not a mid-year budget review as part of the budget process uh, going forward. Because it's in the rates and fees schedule, it's not a separate policy. Could, could we make sure that we, um, that this comes up as a discussion item when we do rates and fees? Because it might be, make sense to pull it out of rates and fees and have it be a separate policy. It seems a little odd to have it in rates and fees. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, I'm going to vote to support this. So I move that we approve the um, commercial activity permit for Donald Smith to rent his privately owned vessel at the Oyster Point Marina. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Ciancarelli? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. President Matouche? Aye. <coughs> Do you have anything business-wise that would assist in the last six minutes uh, the operation of the district? Any priorities? On the agenda, you mean? Yes. I would leave. I'd leave that to the board. Uh, Commissioner Brennan wanted to pull item six. Uh, perhaps, uh, Commissioner Brennan, your concerns? Um, 
Yeah, so we got an amended report. I don't really understand the reason of changing that language. It seemed like it was better the first time, but maybe there was a reason. Um, my main comment about this is I want to make sure that people understand that we are down overnight, well, $20,000 a month um, at Oyster Point Marina because we've lost the monthly rental income of um, or lease income on parcels B, C, D, and E. So in case everybody wasn't aware, that's $20,000 less um, a, a month that the district receives. There's um, the other comment I wanted to make is just that this um, the spreadsheet that we got, um, if there's a way we could get these spreadsheets produced so that they're they take up the full page. That'd be super helpful because you kind of need a magnifying glass um, to read this. And that was it. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve item six? I move that we approve item six. Second. Okay, I'll second it. Um, roll call. President Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorena? Aye. Commissioner Ciancarelli? Commissioner Brennan? Aye. All right. Um, Commissioner Brennan wanted to pull item eight. Uh, can I have Commissioner Brennan's comments on item eight? Yeah, I wanted to make sure that people knew um, that we're having the uh, 30th anniversary of the Pillar Point Harbor Lighted Boat Festival. And um, the event is coming up early this season. Let's see, where's the date? It's, uh, is it on it's here? December 9th, 6 to 8 p.m. Oh, December 9th? Yes. Okay, because there there's apparently been some confusion. I've been getting emails from people trying to figure out when it was gonna happen. It's always the second Saturday. Second Saturday, okay. And um, what time does it start at? Six to eight. Oh, six to eight, okay. So I just wanted to make sure people knew about the Lighted Boat Festival. It's a really fun event. It's beautiful. Um, some of our tenants put out holiday lights. Um, so if you can, attend. Thank you. Do we wish to approve this? Do we need to? It's informational only. Okay. Mr. Brennan, you have item 11 to pull. Um, yeah, this is my report from the California Special Districts Conference, um, and this was the annual conference that was held in Monterey. There were a number of board members there, including myself and Commissioner Lorenas and Commissioner Corrali, however, I believe she was attending as a director on the uh, Menlo Park Fire Protection District. Um, but anyway, um, I wanted to let people know that there was a discussion uh, in the, one of the early meetings which was um, specific to the Bay Area network of special districts and a number of, um, of elected representatives from local special districts were there. Um, the information about that meeting is on the second page of the, of the staff report. And basically what it says is the California Special District Association provides webinars, extensive training opportunities throughout the state, listservs, monthly chapter meetings, and annual conferences. At the September 27 annual conference, a CSDA representative said that there is only one person in the state of California currently elected to multiple special districts. CSDA is proactive about providing training that helps special district boards become functional and or stay functional. Holding two or more elected special district seats is something CSDA trainers strongly discourage. CSDA trains board members to avoid this behavior because it harms the credibility of special districts, is fodder for negative press, results in avoidable legal expenses and lawsuits, 
makes lobbying on behalf of special districts more challenging and appears unethical from a public perception standpoint. So those were the takeaways from the Bay Area Network meeting. Thank you. This is information only. I guess we don't have, I guess we can just approve item 11 after thanking Commissioner Brennan for her comments. It's a quarter to 10. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Excuse me, I submitted a speaker slip. You submitted a speaker slip for an item not on the agenda. We usually take those. Who was I confirming? Okay, I just, I'm going to say this anyway. I have been coming to several of these meetings. You don't get through all the information. And you are elected officials. You are here to report to the public. And if you can't get through this information, then you stay in this room until you do. There are items on this still. Some of these commissioner items are going to get rolled over again. And now you said that only one item. So that means a couple of these are just going to get lost. That is not okay. That is not how you run a good board. You get you stay here until the information has been disseminated, the public's heard everything, and you're done with your agenda. I think they have adjourned. They <coughs> authorized themselves to go on time.